Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will start in a few seconds uh, while we wait for everybody to have time to log on. So it will not be long. We'll be starting very, very soon. I can see the number of participants uh, still going up. Uh, so we'll just wait for everybody to have a chance to come in. And then we will get going. Thank you. Okay, the number of participants seems to have stabilized, so I think we can uh, start. Um, good morning, uh, hi, and welcome to the uh, second day out of three of the annual CASES conference, the Canadian Association of Security and Intelligence Studies. Like last year, because of the pandemic, uh, we are holding this conference in a virtual session, in a virtual format, sorry, and in partnership with the University of Ottawa's Centre for International Policy Studies. My name is Thomas Junot. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa and also the Vice President of Cases. So I will be chairing the first session today. For those of you who missed it, we had a great first session yesterday with uh, Daniel Jean, who is a former National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister in Canada. Now, among other things in retirement, a senior fellow with us at the University of Ottawa with Trisha Geddes, who is the Deputy Director for Policy at CSIS and uh, Leah West, a professor at Carleton. The session yesterday focused more on how the intelligence community in Canada has adapted uh, to the uh, pandemic with a bit of a discussion on the way forward. Um, there will be a video uh, online of this session if you missed it, it will be posted uh, in the future. Today we have two sessions, uh, the second one in 90 minutes from 12.30 to 1.30 Ottawa time uh, will be chaired by Greg Fife and will feature as a keynote speaker Professor Eric Dahl. But for the next 90 minutes, uh, we will focus on uh, how the pandemic has affected the threat environment. Um, so to do that, we have three great speakers with us today. We have Stephanie Carvin, who is an associate professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, and the co-author with me of the very recently published uh, Intelligence Analysis uh, and Policymaking, the Canadian Experience. Um, after that, we have Keith Ditcham, who is a senior research fellow with the Royal United Services Institute in the UK. And third, we have Akshay Singh, who is a non-resident research fellow with the Council on International Policy. Each will speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then that will leave us a lot of time for Q&A after that. For the Q&A, you have a small Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and you can use it to type up questions that I will read out uh, to the speakers once we um, get to that point. So we are uh, ready to go for the first speaker, uh, really in uh, arbitrary order. We can start with uh, Stephanie Carvin. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. And yes, it's you know definitely non subliminal advertising here uh, of the books that Toma mentioned. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, I, I'm Stephanie and uh, I'm going to be speaking. I'm just going to share my screen. Who doesn't love a good PowerPoint? Um, so I, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the information environments. Uh, Actually, is here. He's a real expert on, on China. I would love to speak about that. I will touch on it a little bit, but I think there'll probably be a little bit of crossover with, with our two presentations. So I there we go. Um, so just the agenda that I've set out in this brief presentation is I just want to give a quick caveat about speaking about foreign influence activities, uh, kind of talk, just briefly remind people what we're talking about, the aims and the narratives. And then um, as well, it's not foreign influence activity, but if we're talking about the information ecosystem here in Canada, we also have to talk about the domestic environment and how um, the networks that have developed uh, since the pandemic started and how that's kind of entered into this kind of unfortunate soup that we have. And then finally, I want to look at the implications. So my caveat is this. Um, foreign exchanges are good. Like people talk about foreign influence like it's always a bad thing. It's not. There's a reason why we have embassies in the world. And that is to actually share ideas, understandings, these kinds of things. Um, you know, we want people to think nice things about Canada. So the issue here is when the influence actually becomes 
clandestine, right? That it's unknown and that it's usually, you know, I'll, I'll actually get a little bit more into this, but it actually hurts Canada in some way. We also have to respect people have the right to freedom of belief and expression. So, you know, I might disagree with someone who thinks that, you know, we should take a more pro-China view, but that doesn't mean I they're an agent of influence, right? They have the right to openly believe these things. Um, and then finally, it's also really hard to measure the nature of this problem. So much of it is unknown. And, uh, you know, I'll actually be talking about it in terms of the, uh, you know, the challenges that we have in, in, in kind of measuring these things. So we actually do have a fairly precise definition of foreign interference activities or foreign influence activities in the CSIS Act. Um, and then CSIS actually kind of went ahead and, and expanded on that uh, in 2005, where they talk about you know, activities detrimental to the interests of Canada, which are directed, controlled, finance, or otherwise significantly uh, affected by a foreign state organization, their agents, or others working on their behalf. So really, if we look at the definition and, and the CSIS kind of understanding of it, it comes down to four things. First, Firstly, it has to be foreign directed, right? If it's not foreign directed, it's not foreign influence. It has to be within or relating to Canada in order for it to really kind of fall under the CSIS Act. It has to be detrimental to the interest of Canada. And then it has to be one of two things. It either has to be deceptive or clandestine or alternatively involve a threat to any person. So we've heard a lot of in stories in the media recently, for example, um, there's been allegations that Saudi Arabia has been sending individuals to potentially kill someone who's uh, some, uh, here in Canada. Um, there's also been attacks on dissidents and these kinds of things. So that's what you mean by threats to persons. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking more about the information environment, but I think it's worth noting that CSIS actually believes, as do I, um, separately, but for, you know, just to, to point that out. Um, the fact that you have uh, really like the, the, the in-person foreign influence seems to be the primary concern in Canada, um, which actually kind of makes it a little bit different perhaps than from other European states or even perhaps the United States, but it's the in-person stuff that's actually a problem that it's not totally separate from the online space, but um, we can maybe tease that out in the questions. So again, when you look at uh, talk about the forms of influence, you do have the clandestine kind, uh, threats to or, you know give the clandestine, or you have the threats to person. Uh, it can be in person, or it can be online. And then we do see a range of tactics in these spaces as well. So you have front groups, propaganda, coordinated messaging, political influence, cultivating ties, online messaging, intimidation, the monitoring of diaspora, and forced remittances. Um, and so when it comes to like narratives, like the kinds of things that I'm going to focus on today when it's we talk about the information environment, I, I, I'm kind of influenced by the work of uh, Andrew Weisberg, uh, Clint Watts, and uh, J.M. Berger. They did a lot of this work around 2016, and I think it still really applies today, that, you know, they've picked out the kind of, of, of different goals. Uh, it really, is, and a lot of it kind of centers around this idea of just undermining trust, right? Confidence in democratic government, exacerbating um, fractions, uh, Clint Watts has this expression of trying to take social cracks and turning them into chasms, making, you know, making people more angry with each other than they otherwise would be, um, eroding trust, uh, in the case of Russia, popularizing their agendas, you know, kind of like poo-pooing on NATO and things like this, and uh, creating a general distress or confusion, um, Again, trying to blur the lines between fact, uh, fact and fiction. We have seen, you know, allegations to try and turn accidents into like conspiracy theories about different missions and, and, and things like this. And this is a problem that's likely to get worse with the ad, uh, with the developments in artificial intelligence and technology that's going to be able to create in real time, like like real video that will basically simulate events. And it's just gonna be really, really difficult, I think, for people to tell the difference between um, what's real and what's fake. So again, when we think of the narratives that we've seen, um, and again, this is just kind of a general overview. Um, you know, we've seen these, these narratives being propagated by state actors, in particular Russia, but not solely by Russia. Basically the idea of voter fraud, um, the system's rigged, amplifying those messages, absolutely. Um, talking about financial instability in the market and market crashes. Um, on social issues, again, turning that crack into a chasm. Natural resources, that's one that I think in particular affects Canada. Uh, migration, police issues. Um, and then of course, uh, global calamity, which, you know, this is kind of how we slide into the pandemic. Uh, you have nuclear war, conspiracy theories, the idea that we're setting up this world government. 
Um, this slide is a bit of a disaster, but all this to show is one of the ways that this messaging is done very well. You know, it, it's one thing for a yeah, state just can't come out and say, hey, it's, you know, this is this cabal that's trying to take over the world. I mean, this it wouldn't be taken very, it wouldn't be very effective messaging. So what we see is this kind of, the point that I'm trying to make here with this slide is that this is about laundering narratives, right? Like how do you actually get something into the mainstream discourse? So, um, you know, in this case, if you see on the, on the under the, the black or covert, uh, it's hecklers, honeypots and hackers, right? So these are the people who either steal information, try to alter information, try to heckle people to make um, useful discourse impossible, um, or people who are just there to kind of like torment people off social media. Um, it's then a lot of these narratives are then picked up by the kind of info wars of the world, all these kinds of uh, gray sites. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, sites like RT and in Canada, I'll actually talk about this kind of our alt-right media will often pick up these narratives as well. And so this is how this stuff gets laundered through the system. So the Canadian context here is a little different. Um, there's a number of states that have been accused of engaging in clandestine foreign influence, whether online, offline, but often uh, kind of visualizing both uh, Russia, China, Iran are probably the top three, but there's also been accusations from Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and India. And there's probably a growing number of states because this is a very cheap tool, right? It's not hard to set these things up. It's hard to do effectively, but it's hard to, to really kind of set these, it's not hard to set these things up. So we, I think we're going to see more and more actors in this space, which it's going to be a problem. The thing is with Canada is we're often not the direct target of these messages. We are heavily influenced by the United States. There was a research that came out, I believe, out of the uh, Bell Center uh, in Montreal. They said that uh, for every nine, sorry, for every 10 tweets that a Canadian retweets, nine are from the United States, right? So when those narratives exist in the US, they come to Canada. And this is what, you know, then has an impact. But, you know, we don't have, you know, purple states per se. It's actually harder to disrupt our political actual system, but it's not that, it, you know, we are definitely affected by uh, the kind of political narratives and discourse that are happening. And we saw that it mentioned in the Threats to Democratic Institutions paper that was released by the Communication Security Establishment earlier this year before the uh, election. So pandemics are an obvious target for this. Not the first time it's happened, of course. Uh, there was Operation Infection, which uh, sought, was basically a Soviet uh, plot to try and get uh, people to believe that AIDS was invented by the United States as a kind of bioweapon. Um, eventually, when Russia or Soviet Union realized it needed help, it kind of knocked it off because it realized uh, this was not very good for it. But this is where this kind of ties into the second part of the presentation that I want to make, which is about how, you know, I mean, we have on the one hand, these kind of state actors, but actually, I would say probably the most influential actors that we've seen since the COVID-19 pandemic are those who are part of, you know, for lack of a better term, the anti-public health measure network. So these are people who are uh, anti-lockdown, anti-mask, anti-vaccine, and how they've come together. Uh, so we have, um, I did a report with Amara Mersingham and Kurt Phillips, and we hope to get it out through this Institute for Strategic Dialogue. It's in editing hell right now. But basically, we, you know, with the lockdowns, uh, we saw an almost immediate rise of anti-public health measure movement after laws were introduced. Some of these groups have existed for for a very long time, like vaccine choice has been around since the 1980s, but we saw like a huge surge of groups and like no more lockdowns, Canada, hugs over masks, nurses against lockdowns, uh, which has now been merged into Canadian frontline nurses, the Liberty Coalition of Canada, the line, and a lot of these actors actually who are involved in these movements are also um, very much a uh, part of protest movements from before like a lot of these individuals were part of the yellow vest movement or soldiers of odin and they've kind of just left on the, this new thing so the current movement i think we could describe as fairly fractious but we did come up with these four nodes that are kind of propagating these narratives so in terms of far-right media we have uh, broadcasters like chris sky or vloggers like the uh, plaid army account on twitter various facebook accounts who are you know they'll show themselves at rallies and these kinds of things um we have the old school media there's actually a, a newspaper i think i have a picture of it uh this one that's the COVID 19. yeah over here um so you can see down there in the back corner it's druthers they've actually come up with an old school newspaper and they i don't know if it's druthers or druthers 
I, I actually never figured that out. I like to call them truthers sometimes. It just sounds fun. Um, but the, um, instead of being truthers, okay. But I mean, uh, the pandemic, uh, they actually put out, out leaflets in, in, the, uh, in people's mailboxes. Um, and then these narratives that are put out there on social media are then kind of laundered into more of the mainstream alt-right, like Rebel News, The Western Standard, True North, Post Millennial. And a lot of them do launch campaigns. So actually, if you look there, there's the No COVID Jails campaign that was rebel media um that that was kind of put out there so that was um something we've seen the second one here is politicians um so there's a number of politicians that have kind of tried to uh find support in the anti-vaccine movement to push these narratives forward maxine bernier randy hillier derek sloan the christian heritage party of british columbia there's like a whole kevin j johnson who's actually now going to jail for um basically because he couldn't stop um saying terrible things about uh, <laughs> a businessman, um, a Muslim businessman. Uh, and then uh, there's also then the IMBE groups, right? So what we have seen are the anti-government, neo-Nazis, white supremacists trying to take advantage of these movements. We have seen them actually at the protests. They're adapting their propaganda and they're attending, uh, attending anti-lockdown protests. And I think what we're all thinking is that they're going to try, you know, eventually COVID will end, but you know, now that you have this movement, can you actually even just take a percentage of this movement and bring it more to, towards the far right? And that I think is the big concern. And then you have the anti-government, right? Um, you have uh, sovereign citizens, freemen on the land, QAnon. Um, there's a lot, there's this conspiracy theory about Romana Didulo, I think her name is. Uh, and you'll see there at the top right, um, someone they, they're giving out cease and desist orders to pharmacies that were handing out vaccines and, and things like this um, that were out there. And finally, you'll see, uh, I think on the bottom left, there is uh, Pastor Henry Hildebrandt. He joins another of other pastors, uh, Arthur Pulowski, uh, James Coates of Edmonton's Grace Life Church, um, that have really been, um, you know, propagating kind of anti-government narratives and anti-public health measure narratives as well. And this kind of, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that these have tied into narratives that have been propagated by states, right? States see these movements, they seek to amplify them. And so in some cases, they, they're believed to have actually helped create or at least really played a big role in, in propagating narratives. Like um, even before uh, COVID, the idea that 5G was creating sicknesses was something that was heavily propagated by Russian bots and these kinds of things. China, you can see there on the top right, has also got into the act, basically suggesting that COVID was America's fault. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing this all kind of come together in some really terrible ways. Um, so the implications of this is that, you know, I think with foreign interference, the, the primary threat in Canada will remain to be on person, but the information space is actually changing um, fairly considerably. Uh, there's concerns about where these networks go next, as I already mentioned. Will they continue to pick up traditional far right issues, anti-immigration, Islamophobic and anti-Semitic narratives? But there's new actors. Um, you'll see here, sorry, I keep jumping back and forth, but Canada First is what's called the Groper Movement. Uh, they're part, uh, they're kind of modeled off of the America First movement that's in the United States. Uh, and they're very youthful and they take a, a very hard, they have a deliberate policy of trying to subvert um, conservative movements to take on more far right positions. Uh, there's an alignment, I think, between the foreign adversaries and anti-public health measure networks on the narratives of distrust and calamity. We're seeing more actors in this space. And I think the other thing that we're really seeing is we're maybe less public propaganda, but for far more use of um, encrypted apps, Telegram, I don't think that's anything new, but also WhatsApp chat groups where messages can be put, you know, received and pushed at very, very quick pace. So uh, that's my topic. I, I'm happy to talk more in detail about any of these things, but uh, thanks for the opportunity to present and I look forward to hearing about the other terrible things that the other co-panelists will talk about. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Keith, you are next up. If you can unmute, open your camera, and I think you have a screen to share. So thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I'm at the very end of my presentation there. Um, Thomas, can you just tell me whether you can see that? Yes, that's good to go. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning to you. or well, good afternoon. I, I'm calling from the UK, um, but I gather it's... Uh, around about midday uh, in, in Canada at the moment. Uh, and thank you very much to, 
to the team for inviting me to talk today about sort of an international overview of organized crime. Um, uh, and I was asked to do this really just to sort of look at everything internationally, not necessarily in relation to Canada. So I do apologize if you feel that uh, um, I don't mention Canada enough, but um, what I would say is the areas that I will cover will include things that are germane to global uh, serious organized crime and will be the sort of things that you're seeing and experiencing in Canada and, and North America and uh, local environs. Um, so my name's Keith Ditcham. Uh, I'm Senior Research Fellow working within the Organised Crime and Policing Research Group at RUSI. Um, very quickly, a little bit about RUSI. Uh, is my, RUSI is the Royal United Services Institute. I'm led to believe it's the world's oldest think tank, originally started as a military think tank by the Duke of Wellington in 1831, so we're not far off 200 years old. Uh, I don't think we still employ anyone from those days. I think uh, they're now gone. Um, but you can see from this slide that we cover a range of topics. RUSI was originally set up as a military and defence think tank, but has morphed and expanded over recent years to look at a wider range of security threats, and therefore things such as international security and geopolitics, um, terrorism, uh, organised crime and policing, cyber crime, um, just to name a few have all been included. Uh, part of my responsibility within the team is to run uh, or help support, shall I say, two EU-funded projects. One is the Global Illicit Flows Programme, which originally was called CORMS, the Cocaine Root Monitoring uh, Programme, uh, but this now looks at a much wider range of global illicit economies and also the Critical Maritimes Route Programme, or CRIMSON, CRIMSON 3, as it's known. Both of these have been running for somewhere in the region of seven, seven years now, and RUSI's had a long association with those, with those projects. And previously, I was the co-driver when I worked uh, as an international liaison officer for the National Crime Agency on the cocaine programme uh, impact, um, and spent much of my career working internationally, either living and working in Colombia, um, and other parts of Latin America, and also the Netherlands and Spain. So I feel that I'm reasonably well qualified to talk about organised crime matters um, uh, in as much as anyone with a law enforcement background can. Um, okay, why is it of interest to, to me in particular or to us? Well, uh, from the European Union, SOCTA as it's called, you can see for yourself there that um, this was said about the EU, but actually similar comments have been made globally as well. And it is something that deeply affects all layers of society, uh, not only in addition to the uh, daily lives of its uh, world citizens, but also it undermines the economy and state institutions and the rule of law. Um, I think one of the issues, however, when we talk about threat, and that is a contested term, uh, is that there are many contested terms when, when we look at serious organised crime. Um, one of the issues and, and the problem of estimating the size of serious organised crime is that it doesn't denote a clear and coherent uh, phenomenon, but rather a fluid and ambiguous uh, and diffuse construct. Uh, and there are many um, interpretations of what we mean by organised as well. Um, but with those, those issues aside, and, and I wouldn't want to, to go too much into that, Otherwise, you may actually ask, what's the point of my presentation? Um, I think it's fair to say that what we, what we understand to be organised crime uh, seems to be expanding uh, and impacting on the lives of more people globally than, than it has in the past. And the indications are set uh, that that is set to continue. Um, the vast majority of organised crime is related to the trade in drugs. Uh, I'll come back to that point on the next slide and, and potentially contradict myself, um, but organized property crime, excise fraud, trafficking in human beings or uh, human trafficking, depending which term you like to use, or modern slavery, and online and other frauds and migrant smuggling. Uh, in relation to online uh, crimes, etc. well, through the pandemic, we have seen a real explosion in, in that activity, not only online frauds related to things such as the purchase of uh, 
uh, protection, personal protection equipment, but also in relation to scams around government schemes for uh, paying furlough uh, and other um, tax incentives, et cetera, as well. So we've seen a real expansion in, in that form of organized criminality. What I haven't seen and haven't been able to detect, and, and maybe um, and this is something you may have seen in Canada, and I'd be particularly interested to hear, is necessarily any cross-fertilization of organized criminal networks. Uh, and what I mean by that really is that criminal networks that perhaps were originally engaged in one form of criminal activity, let's say for argument's sake, drugs, during the pandemic have found it hard perhaps to service that, um, uh, service that industry and have moved into other areas such as fraud for argument's sake or others. What I've found is that the COVID pandemic has given a new diet, a new story, if you like, for, for those that engaged in fraud uh, to use as a backdrop for their nefarious activities, but not necessarily for people to move within uh, different crime sectors. That said, we are seeing more and more polycriminality, and this is the cross-fertilization of crime groups that are involved in drugs transport for I can say sharing that transport with the movement of other illicit uh, uh, commodities and included in that and I'm sorry to say when I talk about commodities are uh, people uh, not because I view people as a commodity but because criminals invite uh, we very much do regard them uh, as a com commodity but you'll see for yourself that uh, nearly half of the organizations that that are involved in global organized immigration crime are involved in the drugs trade. Uh, and someone I was speaking to earlier today asked me why, and I think the answer really is, is because it is the one crime that is truly global with huge profit margins. Uh, and therefore, if you have the networks in place and the ability to launder the money, it still remains an extremely lucrative uh, and attractive um, criminal venture for organizations to be involved in. But it's quite clear that criminals do spread their their risk and do look at other uh, other forms of criminality uh, as well. Certainly within perhaps the same sort of tax not taxonomy of uh, crimes that, that where they're involved. Okay, so looking at the global organised crime index that was published this year, and 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 one thing I'd like to highlight. So this was published this year, and it's a, it's a very good document produced by. The, uh, GTOC, but um, they say themselves it took two years to produce. And, and in looking at material for this presentation and for a further presentation I'm delivering tomorrow, uh, slightly longer than this one, um, there is really a sort of lacuna of information, recent information around organized crime. There are various reports uh, that are more than 10 years old, uh, and one could argue that they are no longer no longer particularly relevant. The impact of COVID, I mentioned some of that, but I think we're still waiting really to see how that develops and how criminal organizations continue to adapt to that. But one thing is very clear is that they have adapted and have adapted very quickly. Uh, so some of the findings then from the Global Organized Crime Index is that, well, certainly going back to what I said earlier, uh, organized crime does have a truly global reach. Um, and that there are a number of countries that have high levels of criminality and low resilience to that uh, criminality as well. Uh, Asia is probably, uh, it says, is the highest level of, of criminality, uh, but included in their, in their assessment is the Middle East, um, uh, and therefore that in, uh, needs to be taken into account as to their definition of geographic scope uh, of Asia. Uh, and what they say is that human traffic is the most uh, pervasive of all criminal markets globally. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier about drugs, and I did say I was going to contradict myself. But if you can see the, the chart that I've attached there, yes, human trafficking does top that chart, but that's because drugs have been broken down into their component parts. So you have things such as the synthetic drug trade reported separately to the heroin trade, reported separately to the cocaine trade, uh, for argument's sake. And if you put all that together, along with the, the um, uh, psychotropic uh, substances uh, as well, then you'll find that drugs still remains the number one commodity that is moved by organized crime groups. What else did they find out? Well, perhaps uh, finding number four, not a huge surprise that uh, where democracies have 
good uh, levels of governance and governance and strong um, uh, policies in place to deal with some of the enabling factors of organized crime, such as corruption, um, that they have show a high level of resilience um, to crime. And that tends to be in democracies rather than authoritarian states. Um, talking about corruption as well, though, um, and I will talk a little about the enablers of organized crime. Um, very much the case that state actors at, at a number of places at the very highest levels dominant agents in facilitating illicit economies and inhibiting resilience to organized crime. Um, one of the largest sieges made of cocaine in Guinea-Bissau in 2018 was seen at the time as heralding a new, uh, a new era um, in drug trafficking, combating drug trafficking in the country. But six people that were arrested in connection with that, um, uh, with that seizure have all, been, have all been since released on somewhat it's argued spurious uh, claims of ill health, um, indicating that state involvement uh, and corruption is still very much uh, key in, in Guinea-Bissau. And that is just but one example, and there are many examples out there of similar, similar activity. Um, and certainly in my time working overseas, I know in countries such as Venezuela, and this wasn't the only, the only country that before any activity was taking place, it was passed up the chain towards uh, government for approval. Uh, and if that approval wasn't forthcoming, then that, then that uh, operational activity did not take place, indicating again, a uh, strong interference in, sorry, the light's just gone out here, I wave my arms around, um, um, interference in uh, the executive uh, in operational matters. Uh, and then lastly, uh, findings that many countries in conflict and fragile states experience acute vulnerability to organized crime. Uh, well, again, perhaps not a huge surprise. Uh, and again, with the impact of COVID um, the, on certain uh, vulnerable communities uh, who have been perhaps made more vulnerable um, through COVID um, and the involvement of organized crime in certain countries who provide a pseudo role of the state, and I'm thinking here of countries such as Brazil and, and the, or, um, some of the, uh, the organized crime groups like the PCC and how they operate in the favelas, um, it's easy to see how organized crime has taken a real grip in a number of countries and the global picture in relation to some of these is not particularly attractive. So um, yes, um, in conclusion from, from the document from the Global Organized Crime Index is that it, the scale and depth of activity affecting our societies will have most likely a long lasting consequence um, and make the world less secure. Driving back development was also posing an existential threat to our natural environment. Um, a couple of things I've mentioned then are around drugs and, and within a sort of 10 to 15 minute presentation, it's not going to be possible to talk about every single crime vector. So I've had to pick out a, a, a few. Um, and a recurring theme here is about uh, how COVID-19 has affected uh, organized crime. Um, and you can see for yourself, we're seeing much larger shipment sizes. Uh, we're seeing larger um, seizures as a result of that, but nonetheless, it's still uh, believed to be a very small fraction of the, the global trade in uh, drug trafficking. Uh, greater use of private aircraft and increased waterway routes uh, as well in order to move drugs through countries, in, certainly in particular in Latin America, that perhaps in the past um, have not been, been used as a large seizure in Uruguay um, a couple of years ago, indicating uh, that that country was now being used as a route to move cocaine and sometimes somewhat circuitous routes to get it into other markets, both within Europe uh, and within the Americas and further afield. Um, and we're also seeing the contactless methods to deliver drugs to end customers. And a particular thing uh, I mentioned here, highlighted in the World Drug Report from UNODC, is the increase in drug sales over the dark web, uh, nearly four times increase uh, um, in recent years. And I think that's set to, to increase. Uh, and probably was set to increase anyway pre-COVID, but like in so many other areas, both uh, legitimate and illegitimate business, um, the greater use of the internet in order to service um, criminality is, is a factor that um, law enforcement agencies are having to, to, to uh, deal with. Um, 
I think another thing of concern mentioned in the, uh, the global uh, drugs report is the number of people with drug disorders. Again, showing an increase. Uh, there's indications that with uh, population increase uh, in Africa, but also um, in terms of uh, increase of drug use, that they're ex predicting a 40% increase in the number of drug users in Africa. So there are new and expanding markets uh, appearing all the time, and criminals are very quick to, to exploit this. There's also, uh, as you can see, there are a public health uh, issue that's connected with, the, uh, with this as well. With almost 10% of those people that are injecting themselves with drugs um, uh, living with HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and I sound that caveat always as well, that, that these are these figures are always um, subject to a certain degree of interpretation and down to the quality of the, the data that's produced uh, and the timeliness of that as well. So um, it may well be that these figures are somewhat um, uh, out of date, despite the best efforts of UNODC to produce a contemporary uh, report. Um, we've seen big changes in the global uh, amount of cocaine that's being produced, uh, although recently that has declined slightly as well. But as I mentioned earlier, seeing uh, the drugs being moved in much larger uh, quantities. Um, heroin is a difficult one really at the moment because of um, the trade in that in some countries has started to decline slightly. But um, with the Taliban recent um, takeover of Afghanistan, uh, who have publicly said they're against uh, uh, drug trafficking. We know in the past they have supported drug trafficking and in a country that is going to become increasingly isolated from the international um, uh, community, it's very hard to see how else um, people are going to make a living or survive in Afghanistan. So I think Afghanistan at one stage, uh, responsible for 80 percent of the production of the world's heroin, will continue still to be a very important country. Uh, and then in particular, uh, we've seen sharp increase in the seizures of fentanyl in North America. Um, this has skewed somewhat the, the global figures um, uh, um, to indicate that, 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 that perhaps this is a much bigger problem um, in other parts of the world than, than it is. But nonetheless, the fact that there are large seizures being made in North America is, is, uh, is of interest and, and at the same time of concern. Uh, okay, moving on just a little bit and talking about something other than drugs. Um, so, so another key threat that I'll say that was mentioned was human trafficking and modern slavery. Uh, and you can see from, from this slide really, or I uh, hope I can interpret this slide for you, is that um, approximately one in four uh, persons that are trafficked are children under the age of uh, 18. In the UK, we have a particular problem, uh, and it's not unique to us, with uh, child criminal exploitation. Um, this is not to be confused with child sexual exploitation, but this is the use of children in order to move drugs, sell drugs on behalf of uh, other criminals and criminal gangs. Um, it's attracted a lot of attention from our media, a lot of attention from our uh, law enforcement agencies and funding in order to try and tackle this. But what's quite clear is that the attraction of using children um, and the age of the children that have been used a year and year seems to be declining all the time, uh, is that they the distance the criminals from having to be hands on with the drugs uh, and the belief that also law enforcement agencies tend to pay less attention to children, in particular to, to young girls. So we're seeing a, a huge uh, increase in the use of children in that uh, particular, uh, what is called county lines drug supply. But also we have seen uh, houses being take over or, or cuckooed as it's called, uh, where uh, drug uh, dealers will take over the premise of a vulnerable person uh, and use that as a base in which to cut, sell and distribute drugs. Uh, so the figures, uh, certainly in the UK, are, are quite, uh, quite concerning about the use of children in criminal activity. And whilst drugs seems to dominate, they are also used in a range of other inquisitive crime, uh, in particular organised shoplifting, uh, um, uh, and uh, reasons to believe that that model of using children in criminality has expanded into other areas and, and without any doubt uh, into other jurisdictions as well. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Women and girls make up um, 
a large proportion of those persons trafficked and predominantly in uh, forced sexual exploitation, but they also make up a significant number as well in forced uh, labour. Um, and um, some of my um, some of my words, unfortunately, have moved around on this slide, so I do apologise. Um, but 64% of those exploited uh, through human trafficking are working in the private sector, 19% uh, in sexual exploitation, and 16% in forced labour. So those figures are, 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 roughly about, uh, are roughly about the same, for the largest part around private sector, and it's largely connected to the, to, uh, the sex uh, industry as well. Okay, so just to just to finish up, really, again, uh, uh, with information that is largely based from from the European uh, Serious Organised Crime Threat Assessment, but there's a couple of key things here that uh, that I really wanted to highlight. One is that um, we've seen um, the sort of large cartels, if you like, and organised criminality and sort of mafia type bosses uh, existence. We have seen. Examples of that still, but nonetheless, we have seen a more, far more diffuse and fluid sort of form of criminal enterprise and cooperation existing between different criminal networks. We've certainly seen uh, people from third states uh, operating in other countries. Um, in the past, if you wanted to deal uh, with Colombia and the cocaine trade, you dealt with Colombians. Now we're seeing Mexico's based, uh, Mexican soy based in Colombia. We've seen some Brits directly dealing with Colombians. We've seen Albanians operating in, in, in Ecuador uh, and in the UK in order to control that trade. Uh, and therefore, we're seeing a far greater number of, uh, of, of people uh, from different nationalities basing themselves in, um, in other countries in order to facilitate organized crime. Um, this is particularly difficult at times for law enforcement to deal with, certainly when they're having to deal with different languages and possibly even very different dialects, uh, perhaps of certainly of some languages that are perhaps um, where there's a limited number of people that actually can uh, understand and uh, trans translate um, those languages. Uh, we've seen, as I say, key actors cooperating criminal networks with service providers that come in uh, together in order to pursue a particular venture and then that network is disbanded afterwards and they come back together in different guise or different shape for a further event, uh, venture but they're not uh, they're not organized crime groups necessarily exist all the time they are extremely agile and far more agile than law enforcement and able to respond to opportunities uh, uh, much quicker uh, and obviously are not hidebound by uh, jurisdictions uh, uh, and nationality concerns etc as well so we'll will exploit that to, uh, to that to their advantage violence well um, yes in, in places like mexico but not just mexico uh, we've seen it in a lot of other countries as well uh, and even in the uk with the the um, county lines, drugs distribution, one that I mentioned, use of violence either to intimidate uh, or to keep people under control, as well as violence in order to take over uh, organised crime um, uh, networks uh, or to take over their, their patch, if you like. And so we're seeing far more uh, violent uh, activity taking place globally. Uh, so both in the severity and, and the frequency is increasing. Corruption, I have mentioned, corruption is a, a key enabling factor and one of the uh, one of the areas that I would always encourage any law enforcement agency uh, to to really ta try and tackle is is the corruption at the highest level because that's what facilitates most of the uh, of the organised crime. The criminal networks need people to be able to help facilitate, turn a blind eye whatever it might be, the, the nefarious activities, and they are very good at, um, uh, at corrupting and exploiting those opportunities. Uh, the money laundering scale is hugely underestimated and performance in relation to the laundering of money globally is not particularly impressive. Uh, it is difficult, it's often multi-jurisdictional and I'm not criticizing the efforts of those that are involved in it, but it is very much um, in a number of countries, still uh, an afterthought or not even not even that. Um, and really it's one of the, we understand that money really is, for most organized crime is the, is the key um, motivating factor and therefore really needs to be front and center of any uh, law enforcement activity. Uh, use of legal business structures in order to legitimize business. We're seeing more and more 
uh, of that activity globally as well, uh, where dirty money is actually washed and turned into clean money uh, over a number of uh, a number of years, uh, and greater use of technology in particular. I mentioned earlier about the dark uh, dark web, but also encryption in terms of communications as well. Um, I think that's my time more than more than used up. So I do apologize for running over slightly, but there's there's a lot to say. And I apologize that I haven't managed to cover all, all aspects of organized crime, but it's given you a flavor anyway. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Keith. That's really much appreciated. We're, we're, we're happy that, that you, you agreed to join us because over the years uh, through cases conferences, one point that's come up every now and then in terms of suggestions for what else cases could do was to look a bit more at, at an angle like this one uh, that, that I think we have not covered or at least not enough in recent cases conferences. So this was uh, very, very useful and, and much appreciated. So thank you for that. And last uh, speaker, uh, last up is uh, Akshay. Please uh, turn on your camera and mic and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Tama, and uh, you know the other presentations were fantastic. So I'm going to have to try and really hard to to follow them up. Um, thank you also for the invitation. So uh, my name is Akshay. You know, um, I'm I've been looking at the Asia Pacific region for a while now, uh, just coming out of the community and looking at this from a national security perspective. And uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the post-pandemic environment and hostile state activity. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be focusing on is uh, related to the People's Republic of China. Um, and I'll give you some caveats before I, I start discussing it. I think Stephanie covered off uh, really well, um, you know, some of the challenges that we have when we talk about uh, information spaces and what hostile states or foreign states or whatever term you want to use in this space uh, are engaging in activities on that in that area. Um, I want to be clear that when we're talking about um, hostile state activity, what we're talking about are in the realm of state on state, um, you know, interference or state on state activities that perhaps don't necessarily mesh well with one another. So in some cases, there will be areas of conflict and policy and influence spaces, perhaps even military, depending on what kind of issues you're looking at. Um, and that's what I'm talking about when I say hostile state activity. It's not to say that an entire state is hostile or that uh, somebody is going to be out there who's hunting you down or that you know there's something crazy going on. It's about highlighting that this country can pose challenges uh, to Canada and our partners. Uh, so one of the things that I really wanted to challenge um, is this uh, discussion that we've been having both pre and post pandemic that middle powers like Canada, um, you know, are unfortunately just along for the ride in a greater US China uh, rivalry. Uh, now, I'm not saying that a US China rivalry does not exist and most certainly does. Uh, but the bottom line up front that I want to give you is this basically this question, uh, if this rivalry did not exist if this competition, whatever you want to call it, between the United States and the People's Republic of China, would countries like Canada still have challenges uh, in dealing with the People's Republic of China or other state, act state actors that are caught within this rivalry? Um, and my, my answer to that question is a very simple yes. I do believe that, and I, and I argue in a couple of things that I've written recently, that you know, despite the fact that there is this US-China competition uh, or strategic rivalry, um, Canada does have some challenges in addressing uh, certain issues with the People's Republic of China, and this goes in multiple spheres of uh, kind of uh, spheres of interest, which I'll cover shortly. So that's really the bottom line up front. If you don't take anything away from my discussion, which is that uh, I think we should be asking as Canadians more and more the question of: Are we just simply blaming our problems on this greater U.S.-China strategic uh, competition, or does Canada, uh, with its values uh, in international affairs as well as domestic values, have uh, legitimate issues that it needs to address on a bilateral nature with other countries like the People's Republic of China. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because if you look at some of the challenges that we have faced within the last, let's say, 18 months or so, um, you know, most notably with the arrests of Madame Meng Wanzhou, and then obviously the retaliatory arrests of Michael's Kovrig and Spavor, um, you know, one of the things, one of the narratives that was propped up in the media quite often, not, not wrongly, was that this is part of, uh, you know, perhaps a rebalancing and power politics. And now obviously, you know, that this issue has been uh, discussed to death. I'm not going to cover it. But one of the things I wanted to raise was the, the shift in the narrative that happened in December 2018, uh, after Meng was arrested. And the reason I want to do that is because I think a lot of people have this artificial uh, kind of stake in the ground uh, to say there is a pre Meng period and a post Meng period um, of affairs, Canada affairs. And a lot of it is predicated upon 
um, the United States foreign policy towards China, which obviously within the last presidential uh, you know, administration took a, quite a shift into challenging China more openly on various issues and to addressing some of the concerns they have on intellectual property theft, uh, state-sponsored cyber activity, uh, foreign interference and espionage. Um, and obviously the question was raised about whether or not other partners uh, from with the United States are simply along for the right. Um, now, I think um, the fact of the matter is that after the arrest, many Canadians woke up to the sense that perhaps, you know, the People's Republic of China, uh, as much of an economic opportunity it is, does pose some challenges to Canadian interests abroad, our values, uh, you know, uh, progressive foreign policy, you know, uh, engaging in an open and secure research, or perhaps even collaborating in certain areas uh, on our understanding of the international rules-based system. Um, now, the one thing I want to raise there is that while we woke up to it, perhaps in December 2018, the variety, the large variety of Canadians, um, you know, this issue is not new. And Canada has had challenges with the People's Republic of China for quite some time. Uh, prior to the arrests of Michael Skovrig and Spavor, you had the detentions of Kevin and Julia Garrett, which happened uh, arguably in retaliation to Canada's decision to extradite another person to the United States. Uh, his name was Mr. Su Bin, who ended up uh, pleading guilty to some charges of transferring uh, secure information on, I believe, the F-35 program or uh, defense platform. Um, and um, the issue is that uh, we kind of didn't really clue in at that point that you know, the People's Republic of China probably operates on a different set of rules than we do, a different set of norms and a different set of uh, international issues. Now, the Kevin and Julia Garrett cases were actually just the latest in a whole series of issues, you know, going back even further. You know, you've got uh, Lai Changxin with the extradition to, to China. You've got, uh, you know, Mr. Chalil, who is still, uh, you know, incarcerated in China, all of these issues. And on top of that, you also have civil society in Canada that is uh, talking about some of the challenges that they're facing in terms of uh, advocacy or trying to raise the fact that Canada's human rights or interests in human rights, uh, you know, should be uh, tantamount or uh, tantamount in the way that we engage with the People's Republic of China. Now, wh why am I summarizing this for you? Realistically, one of the things, uh, one of the reasons I am mentioning this is because a lot of the time when Canada makes decisions that are perceived to be let's just call it anti-China, because that is the term that Chinese uh, state media tends to use or party media. Um, you know, for example, you know, uh, making decisions that are in our best interests on sovereignty issues or making in issues about foreign investment. A lot, of the, a lot of the narrative is Canada is just following in the footsteps of the United States foreign policy. This is an issue of containment. Uh, you know, China is being, a rise is being suppressed and this is all, there's nothing to be done here. And, on, you know, that this narrative is quite powerful. And uh, when Canada does make decisions based on its own interest, uh, I, I feel like a lot of the uh, conversation then, then just becomes, you know, we, we should not just follow the United States or other countries. And that's a very valid argument to make, which is that Canada should make interest-based decisions on foreign policy issues. And this is especially important in, uh, in a post-pandemic environment where we are probably going to see increased state-on-state -state hostile state activity, um, increased um, challenges from uh, digital authoritarianism, uh, the rise of uh, authoritarian countries in the world, and increased challenges to democracy across the globe. Um, and one of the one of the key things that I think is missed in this discussion about, yes, Canada is involved in this and they're just going along for the right, is that we can make decisions both in our interests that perhaps not don't necessarily align with everything that our partners think and not necessarily suffer any consequences beca uh, because of it. Uh, contrarily, if we do not necessarily align with the views of the People's Republic of China, we've seen very quickly that uh, there are very strong consequences to it. And I think that says a couple of things. Number one, um, when we engage in foreign policy openly, uh, you know, influence activities, we do it through a vast bureaucracy, as well as you know, partly through civil society on, in a very open way and transparent way. Uh, and we try to do it through international organizations, collaboration with our partners, so on and so forth. Uh, we don't use clandestine means to go ahead and do all of these activities, uh, unlike certain countries, which you're very well aware of. Um, and when we, when we, let's say, perhaps disagree with a partner that has similar values as us, let's say the United States, we, we don't agree on a specific foreign policy issue, uh, we are much less likely to suffer a negative consequence. Like I, I cannot imagine the United States 
uh, arresting Canadians in retaliation for, let's say, a softwood lumber dispute, for example. Um, and in that sense, what I'm trying to say here is that we do have some shared values with these kinds of partners, uh, openness of judicial systems, democracy. Uh, we have you know, a, an open society when it comes to dealing with certain kinds of issues. It's not to say that our partners aren't, uh, are perfect. This is certainly not the case, but we have some shared values there. Uh, that we can leverage. And in this discussion that we're going to be having in the post-pandemic environment, we're, we're going to be pushed more and more, in my opinion, to, to compare the US and Chinese systems or Chinese linked systems to say, which system do we want to go along with? And to some extent, we will find areas to cooperate with the People's Republic on China. So things like environmental uh, change, climate change, as you, we saw with COP26, and other places, we're probably going to want to challenge them um, and to leverage our partners based on the fact that we have shared values with those partners. Um, and that is going to be increasingly important in the next, in my opinion, 12 to 18 months, especially as um, I, I would argue, we see uh, increased aggressiveness from the People's Republic, um, you know, trying to reassert itself on the global stage, likely because it perceives that it has an opportunity um, in the post-pandemic environment, most specifically with, uh, you know, some of the issues that the United States has had with recently with its dealing with its partners and allies. Um, and Canada has an important role to play in this space. Uh, you know, I think in Canada, we do, we don't necessarily recognize the value of our voice. Uh, we're an important member of the Five Eyes community, uh, which is an intelligence, but also kind of a semi-diplomatic agreement in some ways. Um, you know, and we also are, uh, do have a strong uh, voice in multilateral and plurilateral fora. And countries like the People's Republic of China would love to see countries like Canada support them publicly and uh, to say things like, you know, uh, China's pathway on X, Y, Z issue is the right thing to do um, because it undermines uh, essentially this, uh, this discussion that Canada has shared values with its partners and also inserts wedges into certain types of relationship that Canada has with like-minded states on security and diplomacy issues. Um, and we need to be cognizant of that as we move forward in, our, in the way that we talk about these issues is that uh, our voice is important in the international arena, despite what perhaps domestic politics says about how we uh, perceive our own foreign policy. Um, we can be, uh, you know, our, we can lend legitimacy to foreign governments. And in this case, uh, in the post pandemic environment, a lot of that hostile state activity, Stephanie touched upon a little bit in the influence space is going to be about acquiring Canada's voice and the people who speak for Canada uh, on a public scale to use that to their advantage. Um, the one a couple of couple of other things that I'll, I'll I'll play out in my concluding statements, and then we can hopefully have some questions for discussion on this issue. Um, the one the one overarching uh, issue that obviously we have faced in the last twelve to eighteen months is this issue of you know uh, this huge migration and how we do work and how we um, how we uh, function in a post-pandemic society. Um, we are going to be increasingly um, working from home. We're gonna be increasingly engaging in these kinds of virtual events and hostile states are very keyed up to that idea. They know that uh, there are going to be opportunities in that space. Um, so, you know, I, I believe there's already a question about cyber activities that popped up. You know, I think this, this is one area where uh, we have to be extremely vigilant where we're talking about how how we protect ourselves and how we how small and medium sized enterprises in Canada protect themselves from cyber activities, but also to recognize that in the global uh, research space in the global innovation space. Um, there are countries that are taking a harder line to do so, and if we don't catch up with them, we risk, risk becoming, for lack of a better term, a weak link. Uh, to give you an example, you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation in the United States has announced several cases recently on, uh, you know, prosecuting, uh, you know, instances of uh, potential IP theft or transferring of government information to the People's Republic of China by individuals who don't have the authority to do so. Um, you know, there is a hardening of the environment in the United States, which leads other countries to start thinking, well, if I can't get it from the United States, where am I going to get it from? Uh, they're going to have to start looking at countries that have good linkages with the United States. And Canada is one of those. We have an open economy and innovative economy, and those things are very interlinked. You need to have an open economy and research sector to have innovation. Uh, unfortunately, that also invites an opportunity for hostile states uh, like the PRC to potentially exploit those uh, those open uh, openness and to use our own system against us for lack of a better term. Does that mean that every research engagement or you know uh, investment opportunity or kind of engagement with PRC is nefarious? Absolutely not. Uh, it just means that we, we can't have rose tinted glasses as we move forward in the post pandemic environment about 
those sectors that are going to essentially define our economy in the next 20, 30 years, things like uh, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, quantum computing. Um, there are going to be countries who want to cooperate with us in that space. And we're going to have to ask ourselves the question that I asked before, which is like, which is about values. Do, do the people that I'm cooperating in this space with have the same values as I do when it comes to uh, protection of intellectual property, human rights, uh, you know, their international reputation, so on and so forth. And we're going to have to make some hard decisions based on that, because depending on who we choose, it might impact to some extent um, our international relationships, our status in the world, and to also uh, the way that we are perceived as an open economy or as a reliable partner in certain spaces. Uh, the last thing I will conclude with, because I think I've, uh, you know, I'd like to respect the amount of time that we have for questions, is that at the end of the day, um, you know, the, uh, the great power competition is very important. The U US and China are, are competing economically, politically, uh, they're battling for influence, they're battling for, uh, you know, uh, acceptance. Um, and uh, Canada will have to look at the great power competition and see the opportunities it has to use it to its advantage to some, some extent, but also to recognize that we do have our own independent challenges bilaterally with various countries and with the PRC that's ex ex expressly true. If this great power competition were to vaporize tomorrow, let's say the US and China um, you know, decide to put down their economic tools and say, we're just gonna ignore the last uh, 24 months to 36 months and just continue as always. Uh, I strongly doubt that uh, you know, China would suddenly change and become a demo democratic utopia. We would still have concerns about espionage, foreign interference, IP theft, so on and so forth. And, and we need to recognize that. We unfortunately can't use the great power competition as an excuse to ignore the fact that there are bilateral challenges that we'll need to address um, with or without our partners, but hopefully in a multilateral or a plurilateral way. Uh, I'll conclude there, Tomas, because I'd like to leave enough question, uh, time for questions. Thank you very much, Akshay. Uh, if I could ask uh, our uh, uh, Mike, uh, our uh, technical support, if he could please put us in a four window panel so that uh, we can see uh, the, the, if that's possible, uh, so for the, the Q&A. Um, yeah, I've, I've just set it up, it's done, yeah. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, we have uh, just under 30 minutes left for uh, the uh, Q&A. As a reminder, after these 27 minutes that we have, uh, the, we will move immediately to the second part of the show today, which is our keynote speaker, Eric Dahl. But before that, we have a bit of time. Please ask questions in the Q&A uh, box, which is at the bottom of your screen. While you prepare more questions, and do note that in a few cases, uh, Keith and Stephanie answered questions uh, directly, uh, but in other cases, I will read them out loud. But I'd like to start with a question for each of you uh, before we move on to the, the, the Q&A box. Um, for Stephanie, first, uh, you focused really well on the, the information environment, but I'd like to push you a bit on the response side of the equation, i.e. what can Canada do or not do or what has it done? As, as you know very well, it's a hard balance to strike between security and privacy rights, between legitimate free expression and, and speech that may be problematic for a number of reasons, hate speech, uh, uh, you know, call to violence, etc. So, I'd like you to, to either make some general comments on that, but specifically on how the Canadian government has had to adapt or will have to adapt uh, because of changes in the, the information environment that you described really well during and after the pandemic. So do we have the right tools? What other tools should we develop? What tools should we develop, but we probably won't, et cetera. So that's the question for you. Um, for Keith, you mentioned how the pandemic uh, has accelerated some drug trafficking patterns. You mentioned on one of your slides a uh, number of them, the use of private aircraft, the use of the maritime way. Uh, I'd like to ask you the, 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 the kind of the same question that I just asked for Stephanie. How have, states, how have states adapted to that during the pandemic? Or have they adapted? Uh, you are not a Canadian. We, we actually didn't want to have a, a non-Canadian voice on, on the panel to have a bit of a of a broader focus. So please choose countries that you have expertise on in terms of discussing their response or lack of response, whether it's in Europe or the US, uh, just to have a bit of an idea of, of, of the, the adaptation dimension. Um, for Akshay, you, you talked about, uh, you know, in, in the future of Canada-China Canada relations, a, you said that there will have to be a bit of a spectrum where on, on some issues, Canada will have to engage with China, will have to cooperate with China. You mentioned uh, environment, for example. 
and then all the way to, uh, conf to containment, to confrontation, to challenging, to competition, et cetera. It's not a perfect spectrum, but I think you, you get my idea, right? We need to choose from a menu of, of, of options in terms of dealing with China on a case-by-case -case basis. That goes for Canada. It, it arguably goes for other Western allies. Sure, but how do you do that? So I'd like to push you a bit in terms of, 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 of deepening the analysis on what criteria do you choose which from your portfolio of tools on that spectrum, depending on which issue we're talking about? Um, and two, in addition to, to pushing you on, on how do you make that choice, is it going to work? Uh, is China, and, and I don't have any preconceived answer here, I'm, I'm genuinely asking the question, will China be responsive to the choice of, of uh, you know, a, a constant variation in, in choices of tools along that spectrum. So maybe we can go in the reverse order. We can start by Akshay and then move to Keith and then uh, Stephanie. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, those are fantastic questions. So the number one thing is, um, if, you know, I think when we talk about the spectrum of how we engage with China, the first thing we have to get right is that we need a policy and how we engage with the Asia Pacific region, the Indo Pacific region, because China is a piece of that region. And we can't forget that um, there are other stakeholders that have shared interests vis a vis China. Um, and there are other stakeholders who have shared concerns about China in many ways. So the first step, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is that we need to ask ourselves the question of what do we want to strategically achieve? with the Canada-China relationship? Is it about economic prosperity? Is it about promoting values, so on and so forth? Um, I think in this country, we've had a very strong discussion about the fact that it's either trade or human rights, trade or human rights. You know, we have to, we have to proceed with trade. We can't miss out on the China train, uh, the prosperity mission. And this is partly uh, promulgated by Chinese state media, which says that you do not want to miss the China opportunity. Uh, we just ask that you don't talk about five poisons issues like Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, pro-democracy, Fal uh, Falun Gong, those kinds of things, uh, and or any other core issues. Um, now we have to ask ourselves, are we comfortable doing that? Are we, have to, are we okay engaging with China economically and supporting its public initiatives, its, part, its potential entry into CPTPP and other, other areas which help legitimize the, the government of China, as well as the Communist Party of China's activities to some extent. And if the answer to that question is yes, then we have to ask ourselves, what do we want out of it? What benefit is Canada getting from this engagement? Because I can tell you, if you look at our, our trade relationship with China, it's quite lopsided. I mean, at the end of the day, our most of our trade is with the United States. Um, you know, most of our engagement with China is on natural resources and not necessarily services. And uh, Canadian companies do not enjoy the same kind of access that uh, Chinese companies have in Canada. So part of that question should be, how do we ensure that Canadian entities have a truly open and let's say um, equal treatment in China uh, that, that, uh, that Chinese companies do in Canada? And how does Chinese national security legislation, for example, impact those companies? Those are all questions we will need to ask ourselves in answering that question of how do we cooperate or compete? Uh, in the cooperation space, this is, this is where I think we have to be on board with our multilateral uh, and plurilateral initiatives. We need to be with uh, like-minded partners, need to come together about how can we engage with China on environment and climate change. These are things that are urgent that need to be dealt with in the next 50 years or so at, at the very most. Um, on areas of competition, um, there, we will have to recognize that China competes with us now in a lot of areas where Canada used to be um, you know, a producer, for example, you know, uh, China has a domestic uh, petroleum industry, offshore drilling, for example, they compete with Canada's petroleum industry, but people think of us as a resource. Um, we'll need to identify areas that we can compete with them economically, but also work with our partners to actually try and not necessarily, I, I don't want to use the word contain because I don't think that's the right word, but to, to manage the challenges that, that, that China produces in, in that space. I could go on forever about that, but I'll move on to your next question about is it going to work? And will China be responsible? You know, as a you know, as a visible minority and as somebody who's an immigrant to Canada, I will say that in Western discourse, and uh, there seems to be um, a belief that the West can fundamentally change the way other countries behave, uh, either through multilateral, plurilateral, or bilateral engagement. And in the Chinese case, they are very aware of that. They know that the West wants it to change. But at the end of the day, it the Communist Party of China does not believe that any other system 
is good for China to, to succeed. And that narrative has been repeated by Western academics that say, hey, if the Communist Party of China did not exist to tomorrow, what would China look like? Are you going to be happy with that vision? I think that's the wrong question to ask because we at the end of the day have to realize that the people of China did not choose the government of China. They don't choose its policy. They don't choose its direction. So when we ask the question about will China be responsible, what you're really asking is, will the government of China and will the Communist Party of China respond to Western pressures to, uh, to change? And the answer to me is, uh, for me is on some issues, fundamentally no. On others, I do think there are areas where it can realize that the cost of doing certain things is so high that in its calculus of how do we maintain legitimacy and stability in the, in domestically, and how do we maintain our international reputation to some extent that's a lesser concern, those things will be factored in and they will potentially address their behavior. And there's a lot of things the government of China and the Communist Party of China do that um, don't, aren't necessarily telegraphed. They won't say it openly. They will change their behavior, but internally try and sell that off as a win. And there are some kind of, you know, there are some things you have to read between the lines on in certain ways that they have perhaps changed their behavior on. So, but it requires, in Canada's case, partner engagement. We cannot do it on our own. And the, the cost is always higher when you have multiple states saying exactly the same thing to a country like the PRC. Uh, and we can't go alone on it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Keith, you're up. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for your, for your question. Um, well, I, I think the first point to highlight really is that the use of light aircraft and, and riverine access to, um, uh, to oceans, et cetera, as well, isn't something new, it's something that had already been happening, but it's been accelerated during the, the, the course of the, the pandemic. So there will be a number of countries that are already alive to, to that as a trafficking route and, and already starting to build uh, a response to it. Um, in the Global Illicit Flows program I talked about, we have produced a, a paper on the sort of riverine, the use of riverine channels, um, et cetera, um, in Latin America, but we know that, um, the response in some areas has been has been quite has been quite slow uh, in terms of law enforcement adapting its uh, its methodology. Um, I think really in terms of how to tackle it, um, it's probably a theme that um, if you ask me more than one question, I'm going to come back to it, <laughs> come back to a few times and repeat myself. And this is what around what we call criminal business analysis, and it is really about understanding how. How the criminal business operates in the first place, um, where it intersects with both the legitimate, um, uh, sorry, where it intersects with legitimate um, business as well. So if you're using light aircraft, there are certain things that you need in order to make that work. So, so these things are often referred to as pinch points, and, and there can be others as well. So it may be that yes, the use of you know trying to track boats using. Uh, um, riverine channels etc may be really really difficult and perhaps not worth the effort of stationing a lot of people in one area to try and do that but through the criminal business analysis we'll be able to identify perhaps where they're obtaining the boats where they're obtaining the fuel for the boats how they're how they're financed uh, so there are other pinch points uh, really um, but i think sort of as a general point as well there's a lot of there's a lot of competition in law enforcement uh, i mean i've seen this in countries where I've worked, and I, I don't particularly wish to name it, but you can probably think of them as well. And, and competition between law enforcement agencies hinders uh, cooperation, hinders activity. Uh, I was very fortunate as an international liaison officer to to have a, you know, uh, to really enjoy working in the countries that I did, and, and had very good cooperation. But sometimes inter-country uh, cooperation between certain agencies was, was quite difficult. And of course, the only winners in that situation are the, the criminals who know that and take, take advantage of that. Uh, and best practice in, in, in a number of areas is not widely uh, shared uh, in my view as well. So I think um, good quality, timely intelligence is always, uh, is always extremely useful, but, but we're not always going to get that. And, and what we need to understand better is how the business operates and to identify those pinch points. And if we can eliminate the uh, competition between some of the law enforcement agencies to work together, then I think that we stand a chance of, of being more successful. 
Uh, thank you. What, one point that I wanted to mention in, in my question to you that I, that I forgot in trying to keep it brief, but it, it was interesting that you used the word uh, accelerate in terms of, of assessing some of the patterns of, <laughs> of, of uh, drug trafficking activity, because yesterday in, in the panel on how the intelligence community has adapted, uh, one of the points that came quite a bit was how trends from before the, the pandemic have accelerated during the pandemic in terms of the use of open source intelligence, in terms of cooperation uh, with uh, non-traditional partners, um, et cetera. So it's interesting that that even from the perspective that you took, that that word also came up. Um, third question uh, to uh, Stephanie. I'm going to be mercifully brief because like the answer is, I don't know. Um, I'm really good at being a threat analyst and really bad at fixing things. So what I would, what I will say though, is just, I think what we've seen since 2016, since, um, with the U S election, and then subsequently the, the Christchurch attack in particular has been kind of, um, a focused attention on this issue of hate speech online. And, uh, you know, they, uh, the, the liberal government introduced uh, a bill uh, C-36, right in the dying days of Parliament. That bill has been controversial. Uh, it is very much supported. I mean, if you want to read the arguments on both sides, the arguments coming out of the um, Anti-Hate Canada, which says, actually, no, this is going to provide us with useful tools to combat hate, because um, it, it provides a kind of redefinition of hate and some, some measures that need to be taken. Um, and, and it kind of remedies some of the gaps that were taken out when um, the Harper government removed some some uh, definitions from, from the hate code, I believe. Uh, and then of course you have like free speech people, um, as well as, uh, people, uh, you know, the people who look at privacy, internet governance and stuff like that, who've, who've been sp speaking out against it. I'm not smart enough to make an opinion. I, I do, however, note that there was a really interesting study done by the, um, Canada race relations, uh, foundation earlier this year. We actually talked about it on the pod, uh, I've podcast, uh, the, um, intrepid podcast we interviewed them about it and like the overwhelming of majority of canadians like overwhelming majority want something done about hate speech they think it's bad they think it's bad for canada um but then if you ask them do you want the government censoring speech online they'll say no right i mean but even then like there was actually surprising support for for this so i wouldn't be surprised if the government does introduce some kind of legislation to take action in the near future i think the challenge is just technological um you know when we saw you know some of the QAnon people being um, taken down um, from, from Twitter and Facebook in the wake of January 6th, they went to Telegram, um, they go to Rumble, they go to places like this, like the new platforms that allow them to, to kind of get away with this. So we're not there yet. Um, I don't know. I suspect we're uh, fundamentally broken as a society, and I'll leave my answer there. Okay. You're welcome. Um so I have two questions from the Q&A that I will uh, read out. Uh, the first one goes to uh, Stephanie uh, on the role. You talked about the role of Russia, uh, but what about the role of the U.S. in the dissemination of conspiracy theories, including prior to January 21, and how has that uh, changed in the context of the pandemic? The other question, and I'll ask two uh, right now uh, before we move on to a couple other ones, for Keith, uh, on the relations between state actors and organized crime groups. You touched that uh, briefly in your presentation. Can you tell us a bit more about how these relations start um, and, and maybe how these, you know, the nexus between, and I'll, I'll add that part to the question, the nexus between state actors and organized crime groups, if you could tell us a bit more about how those dynamics were affected or not by, by the pandemic. Maybe starting by uh, Stephanie, why not? Sure. So. Uh... The question, which is escaping my brain. Um, sorry, my dog just came to see me. And this is like, sorry, can, can you repeat, it just remind me of the question? The question is, uh, one of the questions in the Q&A is on the role of the US. So oh, sorry, yeah, okay, Russia sorry. And, yeah. and actually yeah. talked about China, but. Yeah, so where's the US in this? Okay, so the US is always an awkward fit in this because has the US engaged in information campaigns around the world? Yes. Has it engaged in clandestine information campaigns around the world? The answer is yes. Now, we often don't talk about it in a foreign interference kind of way, at least in modern times here in Canada, because it's not, remember those four criteria that I put up at the beginning that it has to be foreign, it has to, it has to be, um, you know, directed at Canada, but also has to be harmful to our interests. Um, we don't really often see the US in that way. So that's kind of why we don't talk about it. Now, that being said, um, there's a number of things to take into consideration. First of all, um, uh, you know, it's interesting, our first big 
inquiries into foreign interference were actually aimed ex explicitly at the US, right? The 1960s commission, the buying buy commission and things like that. All of those um, were kind of out of fear that the US was kind of just gonna dominate Canada. Um, so so you know, that, that concern has existed. The second concern though, that I think more of us are familiar with here is the strong impact of US narratives on Canada. And um, what we have seen, uh, you know, I tried to talk about this, that, you know, the fact that we tend to absorb and regurgitate a lot of US um, political narratives. So I think that's the first thing. Um, but secondly, um, what, what's concerning is we are seeing um, US politicians, uh, whether in the Senate, House of Representatives, kind of spread conspiracy theories themselves. So you do worry about like, it's just going to happen more on an institutional basis. So I don't know if that was the area of the person's inquiry. What I will say is that, yeah, and I mean, you know, we have seen the US engage around the world, uh, Russia, everywhere else to, to, to do these kinds of things. It's just, I didn't talk about it in the context of Canada, because um, from that perspective, it's not really that big of a, a threat activity per se. I think it's more the kind of anti-government folk that, that I'm worried about. Just me. Thank you. Before we move on to Keith, uh, actually, I think wants to say something about uh, that question and then we'll move on to Keith. Yeah, I think this is an excellent opportunity to talk about the differences between influence and interference. And I think Stephanie uh, did a very good job in her presentation. I just want to be, you know, to, a clear reminder on this. You know, when we talk about let's say US narratives, US media, US think tanks, um, most often, if not, they're usually relatively transparent with their funding. Uh, they say, hey, the US government funds me or I've received funding, for example, even from you know, certain intelligence services in the United States. Uh, and they have a specific narrative that they push and, and uh, you know, they're trying to be transparent in that realm about what they're saying and what they're doing. Uh, all countries do this uh, to some extent. And this is in the realm, in my opinion, of acceptable influence. If you're being transparent about, hey, we are providing XYZ entity money to go and talk about these issues, it's no different than lobbying or, or paying for an advertisement. One of the challenges that I find with uh, authoritarian countries, uh, I won't speak to Russia, but on the, on the China side is establishing the link to the state for a lot of entities can be very difficult, if not totally uh, almost impossible in certain ways. So you'll end up with multiple outlets saying the same thing, essentially, with no clear attribution that this message came from a foreign government. And that message is perhaps reverberated in domestic media and countries like Canada without an understanding of the fact that a foreign government was behind it. And I think that's that's a very critical difference to understand is that if a country is being open about, hey, we wanna promote this view and that suits our interests, Fine, that's how Canada does business abroad. Uh, in, in the case of countries like China, you have an entire bureaucracy dedicated to obfuscating the linkages to the state. You've heard the United Front Work Department, that's one of the entities that's involved with it. So I, I think I would just wanna keep that distinction clear, which is Western democracies tend to be open, it's not perfect. Uh, whereas you've got authoritarian states which thrive in the gray space of not being open and leveraging its nebulous relationships. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, okay, so in, in terms of answer to the first part of the question about how those relationships function, um, well, I suppose like any relationship really, and they're built in, in a variety of ways, one of the most obvious ways is through intimidation, but I would suggest that that's, that's not necessarily the, the most common route. The, 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 there's, a, there's an interest depending on who the relationship's with, if it's with a, um, a high-ranking state actor, then there's interest in a longevity in that relationship. Therefore, intimidation isn't necessarily always the best uh, uh, the best method, and it can be quite risky if that person decides to um, uh, is to, to retaliate uh, or not um, not agree to to um, um, to the intimidation. So, uh, people can be recruited over many years, and and favoured way is by actually someone doing a favour uh, for someone that actually starts off as a fairly low level, um, probably minor um, infringement, shall we say, and then um, gradually building that up uh, to a point where actually someone then can be blackmailed, um, that we've seen that. Uh, as I say, intimidation through violence, either against the person or their family can be can be uh, uh, another means, but perhaps more worrying as well, and something we've seen in law enforcement, um, is people being placed, people being deliberately placed by organized crime groups into organizations at the starting perhaps sometimes at the junior levels and working their way up in order to later be of use and uh, an asset to, to criminal organizations. So that sort of sleeper, if you like, and that sort of creeping um, access uh, is something that is actually very difficult uh, to deter. 
the attraction, uh, and we've seen that in, in the military uh, uh, involvement in organised crime in certain countries overseas, we've seen that in the police in the UK and, and, and other countries, and we've certainly seen that with access to politicians in a number of, in a number of countries as well. Um, the attraction to those people, well, uh, often it's financial. Uh, it's very easy for us to be quite pious in the, in the developed world, but in some countries, uh, where you're trying to feed a family and you don't have access to much money and you're suddenly uh, offered a lot of money, you can you can see why it might be attractive. I'm not condoning it, I'm just saying you can see why it might be attractive to certain, uh, um, uh, certain people as well. Um, uh, and at times we've seen um, criminals themselves becoming almost legitimate uh, in the political system as well. And, and um, I suppose the, the best example of that was, was Pablo Escobar himself, but, uh, and I've done well to avoid mentioning his name until now, but, um, uh, uh, but most definitely had he, had he succeeded in, in, in what he wanted to do, he, uh, he would have basically had control of, uh, of Colombia and one, one could argue to some extent he probably still did anyway through, through other, for other means, in terms of how COVID impacted upon that, well, I think um, I think in the with well, those the long term relationships, I suspect probably not not too much. What we did see was uh, areas of corruption um, with um, at borders uh, to certain countries, uh, uh, most notably Venezuela and Colombia. The price for smuggling of people across that closed border rose dramatically. That would have been replicated in other countries uh, globally, most definitely. Um, so people had to pay more in order to get what they wanted, but nonetheless, that uh, that was still a, a viable uh, option uh, to them. So, thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so we have uh, three minutes left. I will combine two questions uh, that I think will go mostly to Akshay and Stephanie, and I would ask the two of you to keep your answers to about one minute. Uh, because we have another session after this, and I, I don't want to start that session uh, late. So there's a question from Wesley on, uh, do you see electoral interference as a waxing or waning threat? And there was another question a bit earlier on, on uh, which has just disappeared from my, my, my view, my, my box, but on the issue of developing resiliency to, to counter uh, threats of disinformation, uh, foreign interference, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, very broad, but in one minute, how do you see that thread evolving uh, up or down and what can we do about it? Stephanie I, first. I'm always reluctant to say that anything is forever. Things do wax and wane over time and they change and they morph. So yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't predict the future, but what I can say is that um, foreign interference is cheap. It's relatively easy to do, but I, but I do say it, it's hard to do well. And it's not like, I mean, one thing I didn't say in my presentation that I should have said is that I think online campaigns, the, the successful ones are not just online, right? When you look at what the you know Russians did in 2016, they had people in, they actually sent people to the United States to learn about US politics, figure out what the hot button issues were, and then went back and then did an online campaign, right? Um, and, and, you know, with the Chinese foreign interference, we see both online harassment and offline harassment. Right. These things are combined. So it's, it's never one, but it's still relatively cheap and easy to do relative to, to other tools. So I, I don't see it going away. In fact, I actually probably see it becoming more of a threat um, with more states learning from other actors in this space. So uh, that's just my prediction. But uh, I've been wrong about lots of things. So, you know, don't take it to the bank um, in terms of what we can do to be for resilience. It's one critical thinking um literature like you know reviews things like that. it's just one of many tools we have seen in particular i think there's lessons we could learn from finland taiwan um other countries that are at like at the forefront of kind of dealing with these issues um and or or regions whatever you want to call taiwan these days um i think they like to be called a country but i might get in trouble um but yeah there's i think we should be turning to other countries who've been dealing with this learn about their tools but we're going to need a whole variety of things so i have one minute i think i'm over i'll stop Thank you. Actually, in one minute. It's hard to follow. So I agree with Stephanie on a lot of things. You know, on the last CISA's public report, they actually named the People's Republic of China and Russia, and they talked about foreign interference. And they specifically said that, you know, uh, there are foreign countries that are looking to expand their interests in China, uh, sorry, in Canada, and to, to manipulate our own system to use it against us. So like Steph, I can't predict the future, but I think as in the post-pandemic environment, 
uh, we navigate some of the challenges that we are having between the conflict between democracies and authoritarian countries, whatever you want, we have to be aware that our system can be used against us to, to further the interests of some of these authoritarian countries, and our electoral and democratic systems are one of them. Um, and, you know, in that report, it clearly says that, you know, uh, these countries are targeting our politicians, our elected officials, to help bring them on board to their vision of how the world should look. And I think that's something we're going to have to be very vigilant about in the next few years, uh, given that a lot of interference can be very hard to detect. A lot of people who, who are worried about interference and intelligence issues don't want to report it to the government out of fear of retaliation, especially in diaspora communities. And we shouldn't expect them to put themselves out there constantly. And regarding uh, the issue of resilience, um, education, honestly, as Stephanie mentioned, understanding how, how we engage in this space and how people can make val uh, like good choices based on open information, reading critically, those kinds of things will go a long way. Uh, and also understanding how certain states behave in, in our electoral democratic system, uh, both at not just the working level, but also at the political and government and official levels at across levels of different levels of government. We focus on the federal government, but we've got other governments that are facing exactly the same challenges with fewer tools uh, because they don't have a national security protection me mechanism and we have to be able to support them. Great. Thank you very much for speaking for barely more than one minute. Uh, that was that was great. So uh, with apologies to the other ones who have questions in the box, uh, given that at its peak, there were about 150 of you in attendance, which on its own is really, really good for an event on national security in Canada. Um, I, apologies, but I did try to ask questions that reflected these other interests. Uh, Please do not leave. Uh, we are moving on immediately to the next panel. I do want to say thank you in particular to the three speakers uh, for a great, uh, a great uh, talk. Uh, thank you, uh, of course, and we have to say that every single time to Anna and Mike from SIPS, who uh, are the ones who are making this uh, possible. Um, and I do also want to make a quick plug uh, that if you are interested in the impact of the pandemic on Canada's national security, on Canada's intelligence community, directly touching on some of the things that were discussed today, uh, but also yesterday and tomorrow. Uh, we have another book coming out in uh, December or November. We're actually not completely clear on the exact publication date, but very soon, uh, co-edited by myself, Leah West, and Amar Amrasingham on exactly that, how the Canadian intelligence community has adjusted. So that will be available very soon. On that, I'm very happy to pass the uh, chair role to Greg Fife. I think everybody here knows Greg, uh, past president of CASIS, um, and uh, with a long career in the Canadian government, including uh, in his last position as the head of the Intelligence Assessment Secretariat in the Privy Council office. So Craig will uh, chair the uh, next session. So thank you very much and all yours. Thanks, Thomas. G good afternoon, everyone. Um, our guest speaker today is our keynote speaker is uh, Eric Dahl, who's the associate professor and associate professor at the U.S. Uh, Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Uh, Eric was a naval intelligence officer for 21 years and then took his experience uh, to the academic side to develop and share his ideas. Uh, he holds a Ph.D. from Fletcher School at uh, Tufts University. Eric was a keynote speaker at CASIS after the publication of his 2013 book, Intelligence and Surprise Attack from Pearl Harbor to 9-11 and Beyond. This book was an extremely important contribution to the literature on assessment and warning intelligence. It, it analyzed when warnings were actionable by decision makers, contrasting tactical actionable intelligence with strategic but less detailed assessments describing possibilities without enough certainty to justify dramatic and resource intensive responses. Responses is the start, not the end of an effective warning cycle. His current work on the COVID pandemic addresses one of the key questions at the center of this symposium. What is needed for, better pandemic, for a better pandemic warning system and what part can the intelligence community play? So like the, with the previous session, I'll be watching the chat for questions and answers for questions uh, that uh, Eric can address. So Eric, over to you. Thank you very much, Greg. And uh, it's great to be back with cases. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Let's see. You should be able to see that now, I think. So let me just say, I'm, great, thank you. Thanks again for the introduction, Greg. And, Thank you to CASIS uh, for inviting me again, and thank you to everybody for being here with us today. 
I'm really looking forward to talking with you about the intelligence and the warning aspects of the pandemic. I'm going to be making an argument, and I really want to see what you think about that argument and, and what your comments are. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion. But that argument is that the pandemic has been a global intelligence failure. Canada has been involved as much as the United States and the rest of the world. We'll talk about all of that. And I should mention that this uh, comments, my presentation builds on uh, my next book, which I've recently finished, but it's going through the, uh, the uh, lengthy uh, editorial and review process. I hope the book on, on this topic will be coming out uh, early next year. So let me tell you sort of where I started in thinking about this problem. Early on in the pandemic, like probably most everyone with us today, uh, I was struck by the, the puzzle or the paradox of how could this disaster have happened? How could the global pandemic have happened? How could we, it seems, have been taken by surprise when we've been warned about the threat of a global pandemic for years and for even decades? So how could we have been surprised when we saw it coming? And when I started thinking about this and thinking about how this fits into my previous research, I realized that the puzzles, that sort of paradox that we've been dealing with ever since the pandemic became global, uh, this puzzle is a very similar to one uh, to the puzzles, the questions that we've been asking after previous major disasters and intelligence failures, such as Pearl Harbor. There were many official investigations after Pearl Harbor but the most extensive one was called the Joint Congressional Investigation. And that commission asked the question that sounds like one that we're asking today. They asked, how could it have been possible when the United States had before the war, what at least arguably was the best intelligence system around, how could we have been taken by surprise? And of course, we've all been asking similar questions even more recently with the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And here's just one example, for instance, Michael Morell had been the deputy director of the CIA, the acting director of the CIA, and he had been President Bush's chief presidential briefer on 9-11 and in the lead up to 9-11. And as he has argued in this recent rethinking of, of issues with the 20th anniversary, he has argued that the CIA had provided the, the best warning possible. He calls it the loudest and most persistent warning about the threat of what turned out to be 9-11 uh, in the history of the agency. So how could 9-11 have happened? Now, my argument is, first with the pandemic, as I mentioned, the, the pandemic has been a global intelligence failure. It's been an intelligence failure, first on the part of traditional national security intelligence agencies, but even more so, it's been a failure on the part of the many national and international medical and public health surveillance and uh, intelligence organizations and systems. All of these agencies and organizations and systems have been set up to warn about just this kind of a crisis. And yet the crisis happened and still so many are dying every day. And I was particularly struck by how similar the failure is, the problems have been in the pandemic with past disasters such as Pearl Harbor and 9-11. Now you might, might ask, well, really, you know, what, can I really be arguing that this is uh, an intelligence failure and I'm hoping we'll have some of that discussion? How could it have been an intelligence failure when intelligence agencies of all kinds in many countries have been warning about just this crisis for so many years? I think it really was an intelligence failure because it showed the same, what I call the same deadly three factors that we have seen on previous cases, such as 9-11 and before that Pearl Harbor. And I'll take a couple of minutes to describe each of these factors, but in short, what I'll be talking about is first, the factor of strategic warnings, big picture, long-term warnings that do very little to stop bad things from happening. The second factor, more specific, what we might call tactical intelligence and warning on the actual threat as it developed. These threats are typically too little and too late. And then the third factor is what I call receptivity on the part of decision makers. And in the case of the pandemic, as we've seen in previous, previous cases, decision makers just aren't ready to listen. They are not receptive 
to the intelligence warnings they get. So I'd like to briefly describe each of these three factors in both and compare the situation with 9-11 and the pandemic. But we need to keep in mind as we think about this, about why this is important. It's important certainly because we still need to get a better handle on the continuing crisis. But even more important, we need to help prevent what all the experts tell us may be a worse pandemic, a worse public health, global health disaster the next time. And even more, we need to learn the lessons from this disaster so that we can help avoid other kinds of disasters that, that we all may be facing in the future. So first, that first factor involved, what I call strategic warning. Now, there are many ways we can define strategic warning. Maybe we'd like to talk about that. But as I see it in the context of, of these failures, these are the kinds of big picture, long-term warnings that we get from prominent officials, from think tanks, from blue ribbon commissions, from war games and exercises, tabletop exercises, the sorts of things that the military, my military background, were very good at doing. These kinds of strategic warnings are really impressive, but almost useless if they aren't able to help produce better tactical intelligence uh, that decision makers can use. So for example, before 9-11, we all know the history now. We've seen, we saw before 9-11, many agencies, many experts such as Richard Clark, the White House counterterrorism advisor, warning about the risk from international terrorism, from Al Qaeda, from bin Laden, but not just from government experts, we saw academic studies, think tank studies that warned about the threat that came to be on 9-11, such as a study, the cover shown here, a DOD sponsored study from 1994 that warned that in the future, in the year 2000, terrorists might use airplanes as bombs, that Americans might be watching on CNN as attacks take place, and the terrorists might strike the World Trade Center because it would give them more bang for the buck. Similarly, before the pandemic, we had many, many strategic, big picture, impressive warnings. We saw Bill Gates, for instance, uh, in sort of the Richard Clark role. He's been warning for years about global health threats. We saw intelligence officials, such as the US Director of National Intelligence, warning early on in 2019 that we need to worry about global health threats and the possibility of a pandemic. We saw War games such as just in October 2019, the picture shown here, Johns Hopkins University and other organizations sponsored a tabletop exercise in New York City. And the following month in November 2019, just one of a number of Blue Ribbon Commission uh, reports that warned about public and global health threats. So what went wrong with these strategic warnings? The problem is it's not enough for experts, for intelligence officials and others to give these sorts of warnings. Leaders need more than that to take action. For one reason, leaders receive all sorts of warnings on all sorts of threats all the time. As an example, early in 2019, when the Director of National Intelligence testified and warned about the threat of global pandemics, he also warned about a number of other threats, some that we've already been talking about today, cyber, weapons of mass destruction, great power competition, environmental change, and more. How is a decision maker going to decide which of those problems to focus on? To prevent disaster, to be able to make effective policies, leaders need more specific, actionable, or tactical intelligence, as I'm calling it. And so that's the second factor here. What I'm calling tactical intelligence, these are actionable warnings of the actual threat arising, not just that there could be a threat downstream from a global pandemic, but here is a virus, let's say, here is an enemy that prevents, presents a threat. The problem is that before 9-11 and before the pandemic, uh, this type of tactical warning uh, was way too limited. Before 9-11, for instance, we all know now, as the 9-11 Commission report told us, that the summer of two, 20, uh, 2001 was the summer of threat with many kinds of threats, such as the famous President's Daily Brief that warned President Bush that bin Laden wanted to strike within the United States, and many other kinds of threats. For instance, the briefing slide shown here, given in late August to the CIA director, the director of central intelligence, about the man who had been arrested in Minneapolis, uh, who we now believe was one of several uh, potential 20th hijackers. And before the pandemic, 
we saw a lot of warning uh, and reporting through traditional intelligence sources and also through medical and public health sources uh, about uh, the, the uh, virus that was developing uh, in, in uh, China. We saw traditional intelligence agencies reporting sometimes what we now uh, retrospectively we wish had been uh, more strident warnings, such as the president's daily brief to President Trump on January 23rd that reported that the virus didn't appear, appear very deadly. But US and other national intelligence organizations were warning and reporting about it. And even more importantly, a number of the global disease surveillance systems, government and private, uh, were reporting on the outbreak uh, during those early weeks and months. So what went wrong? Well, before 9-11, as we now know, none of those more specific warnings actually were about the plot itself. Uh, U.S. intelligence and national security organizations weren't able to get inside the 9-11 plot uh, enough to, uh, to disrupt it. Before the pandemic and in the early days of the outbreak, before it became a global pandemic, there were many limitations here, certainly limitations on reporting out of China. And also traditional national security intelligence organizations were doing a good job, it appears. Of course, we still haven't had any sort of a formal uh, Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, equivalent of a 9-11 commission for the coronavirus, which I hope we will have. But it appears that the traditional intelligence organizations, especially in the United States, were following the open source reporting rather than leading it. And we saw a lot of reporting out of these uh, disease surveillance systems. But as one epidemiologist put it, uh, these systems turned out to be wholly inadequate to the task of reporting on in near real time uh, the spread of this disease. We saw a number of tactical failures. Uh, this audience knows well, this came up yesterday, I believe in the discussions, uh, systems such as the Global Public Health Intelligence Network, GFIN, out of Canada, uh, were not effective. Systems such as contact tracing in many countries, such as in the United States, not effective. The third factor is what I call receptivity among decision makers. Now, it's a, it's a well-known truism of the intelligence business that intelligence warning is of no value if someone isn't willing to listen to it and is educated, is familiar enough with it to be able to make an educated decision about whether to act on it. As we found with the pandemic, it doesn't do any good for one administration to leave playbooks, pass down files, uh, other sorts of recommendations to another administration if they're not willing to listen to it. Before 9-11, we certainly saw this lack of receptivity. Of course, at the top of the Bush administration, we saw top advisors not receptive to warnings from experts such as Richard Clark. But it wasn't just in the, the higher reaches of the White House. As another example, for instance, you would have expected that the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, would have been the organization within the United States government that would be the most primed, would be just very ready to listen to, take action, on reports about possible aviation-related terrorism. But even FAA leaders didn't listen to, they didn't take seriously the warnings they got from their own intelligence officials. And of course, before the pandemic, we know President Trump was very dismissive of, of uh, the, the threat from the pandemic, even when he had learned from sources that he appeared to want to listen to, such as the Chinese leader, that the pandemic, the virus was serious, he didn't take it seriously. I think that this will go down in history as one of the most serious cases of receptivity failure in American history, but there's more to that. I think we just keep seeing the importance of receptivity. For instance, here in the States, the January 6th assault on the Capitol was again a reminder that intelligence warning is of little use unless decision makers are ready to take it seriously, are receptive, as I put it. I think that the lack of receptivity will be seen as a greater cause of the problem in the pandemic than it was in 9-11, but it's, it's just too simple. It's too easy to just blame Donald Trump. For one thing, Trump's lack of receptivity doesn't explain the broader failure uh, to act swiftly in so many countries around the world and the failure to act swiftly and take decisive action in many communities around the United States and, and other countries. And especially in the United States, 
Uh, that's where most of the key decisions about public health are made. So what we've seen is what I think is a tragically familiar pattern. We saw in the case of the pandemic, as we have seen in the past, a series of long-term strategic warnings that turned out to be of very little use unless they either generated receptivity on the part of decision makers, which they rarely do, or produce tactical warning and receptivity uh, when the uh, actual threat occurs. We saw tactical warning that was too, too little too late and leaders who are not willing to listen. So what are some of the lessons here? I think actually there is some good news and this, this sort of runs counter uh, to the conventional wisdom and thinking in much of the intelligence literature, the scholarship on in intelligence uh, sort of captured well by the, the famous comment by Richard Betts uh, in a classic article years ago that intelligence failure is not just inevitable, but it's natural. Well, we, we don't want to, we can't just accept that. And here there is some room for optimism, I believe. For one thing, the US intelligence community at least uh, does seem a, a bit better coordinated today than it did before 9-11 or certainly before Pearl Harbor sharing information. They didn't have enough information to share, but they were trying at least. And I think there's a lot of, of good news in some of the newer disease surveillance systems that, that showed promise in the case of the pandemic. Again, not enough, not fast enough, uh, but, but some promise there. Another lesson, and, and I'd be curious about whether you feel that this applies equally to Canada, but certainly in the United States, one of the major intelligence failures of 9-11 happened after 9-11, when my country gave our intelligence and national security agencies way too much unchecked, unobserved power to monitor our own citizens. This led to lots of scandals and very little benefit, very little actionable intelligence on terrorist at attacks. We need to keep that in mind as we go forward, as we think about new or expanded domestic uh, and public health surveillance programs. So what to do? Well, certainly we need to increase the focus within the intelligence community on global health threats, on pandemics. There was some discussion about that yesterday. Uh, lots of issues we can talk about there. But even more important, we need to do a better job of medical intelligence and surveillance and bringing those two worlds together, the traditional national security intelligence community and the medical and public health communities. And we've got to expand global cooperation on all of this, because the only way to, to get at a global security problem is to take global action. And I'm, I'm not sure that, that things are actually looking very well. We, we have not, as a, as a planet, reacted and coordinated very well in this case. Let me just make a couple of other comments uh, that, that may also uh, be interesting to spark some discussion. I think we need to be mindful about this pattern of intelligence and warning failure that we've seen leading up to Pearl Harbor, leading up to 9-11 with the pandemic. We've got to do a better job next time. This is in part because of course, the next pandemic may be even worse. We've got to make sure that when the warnings come next time, they're going to be heeded. We're going to listen to them. But also, I think there are important lessons that we can take from this disaster or future threats beyond just a, a future pandemic. This disaster needs to serve as a wake up call for other kinds of threats. Certainly global climate change is the most obvious, the one that, that getting so much attention and that is great. But the list of other potential global threats is so long uh, there are a number of challenges here. One, determining what are the threats to pay more attention to, because even a, a vast intelligence system such as the United States really can't focus equally well on lots of different threats. And certainly at the top level, I think of any government, of any government system, the leadership can only focus on a few things at a time. But we've got such a long list of threats that we need to worry about as, as a globe, as a human society, cyber, mass migration, rising inequality, and many other human-caused threats. 
but also the threats of natural disasters, what I sometimes call mega disasters, which often come into this category, as, as many of you are, I'm sure, familiar with, we sometimes call high impact, low probability threats or HILP threats. That kind of a threat, the sort of thing that experts are always telling us, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when, well, okay, but of course, when it makes a difference, when is a thousand years from now or 10 years from now, but HILP threats are some of the most difficult challenges that intelligence and government and national security agencies face. How much effort, how much planning, how much preparation should be put into these threats? And not just HILP threats present very difficult challenges for intelligence and security organizations, but also slow moving disasters such as climate change present real challenges for, for public policy and for intelligence. And here, let me just finish up. I think there are, is again, a little bit of good news. And that good news is that what we seem to be learning over the recent past of, of major disasters, and there are plenty of them, but the good news is that these sorts of strategic surprises are predictable and they have been predicted just as the global pandemic had been predicted. These might be, if you use the, the old terminology from our former Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, these are known unknowns. And that's better than an unknown unknown. At least we, we, we know about the challenge there. These are not black swans that nobody has ever, ever seen. But the challenge is to learn how to listen to the warnings and how to educate, how to train leaders at all levels. Here in the, in the States, so many of the public health uh, decisions are made by county public health officials. Others are made by senior government officials. But how can we train and educate those leaders to be able to listen in a sophisticated manner to these warnings and decide what warnings to listen to and act on? In the US military, we have a long process of training, of educating our rising leaders throughout their entire careers to learn how to deal with intelligence, how to understand it, how to sometimes ask the tough questions of intelligence. I don't think we have anything like that here in the States in terms of an educational professionalization process for civilian leaders. And I certainly don't think we have one for public health and, and medical uh, leaders. We've got to increase our focus on non-traditional threats to human security. But as was discussed yesterday in, in the panel, uh, how do we decide where to put our, our efforts? These are tough questions. I don't have all the answers here. But I know we've got to do this on a global basis. We've got to take a global approach. And one last comment let me make, and this may be a little bit uh, uh, controversial uh, among in, uh, folks with intelligence backgrounds, but Leaders need to be ready to lead, which means they need to be ready to make decisions ahead of the intelligence expertise, ahead of scientific certainty. That was part of the problem in the early days, weeks, months of the pandemic. Too many of our leaders were, were waiting to hear what the experts had to, had to think. They weren't following what I think many on this in this meeting are familiar with, the precautionary principle discussed for instance, after the SARS outbreak a number of years ago, the idea that action can't wait for scientific certainty or even for intelligence certainty. That's another area where we train our, in the US military, we train our leaders to be able to take action even when the situation is unclear because it's always gonna be unclear. We need to be ready to do that as well. So I think that is what I've got. Greg, if I can turn it back over to you, please. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, we have some questions coming in, but I'm gonna start with one. And that is one of, the, one of the issues for the intelligence community in looking at its role uh, with partners across the system, particularly health partners who have the primary responsibility is, is it imaginable that the intelligence community would have access to really important intelligence that's not available to the rest of the community? And following up on your talk, 
would that, in your view, provide uh, enough tactical information that the intelligence community could actually take a lead on providing real tactical warning, even, even where the health community was perhaps not ready or was unsure of the nature of the disease? No, that's a great question. Uh, and, and actually, I've, I've got a sort of a counterfactual that I've developed uh, uh, that I think uh, sort of gets at, at part of what you're, you're talking about. Let me just uh, show two real quick slides because they, let's see if I can get this up here. I think this gets at least to part of what you're asking about. So this is a counterfactual thought experiment about what intelligence success in the case of the pandemic would have looked like. My argument that it was a failure implies that something could have worked work better. And as we know, especially for folks who have, have studied the, the sort of the process of counterfactuals, it, it doesn't make sense to sort of invent some capability out of whole cloth uh, that, that isn't really a realistic one. We, we can't just make up that, that the CIA had uh, some sort of a, uh, an agent within uh, uh, the uh, uh, lab in, in Wuhan uh, that, that gave lots of warning or something. But I think that there could have, based on what we know now, and again, we're still learning, there has been no official uh, study of this in the US. We don't know what's in, available in classified uh, sources here. Um, but I believe an intelligence success would have helped to, remember that, that famous phrase, uh, flatten the curve in the, the early weeks and months of the pandemic. I think that agencies in the US and around the world, national security agencies in particular, would have taken seriously their own strategic warnings. I don't think they, they did. I mean, these strategic warnings were just among many other kinds of warnings about doom and gloom here. We would have had much greater focus. Programs like GFIN that pr predict other pro programs designed to, to detect early signs of, uh, of outbreaks around the world would have been up and running much, much better. Uh, a number of folks, I believe on, on the call here, Wesley Wark, for instance, among others, have written about uh, the failings. Uh, GFIN was discussed yesterday, for instance. I do think that intelligence agencies, the traditional national security agencies, would have been able to lead and not follow the open source data. Now, the first word, at least from what we can tell so far, the first word that the outside world got about the, uh, the outbreak came from some of the, uh, the, the very useful uh, tools such as ProMed and, and other, uh, other tools that are watching or open source uh, uh, indications, but we needed, we needed more than that. And so last slide, and then I'll stop here. Um, I think that the counterfactual means that the key time period would have been late January and early February. And it is possible that if those organizations that have been uh, designed and well-funded to do things such as develop clandestine sources, they might have been able to get inside the thinking of Chinese leaders, for instance. For instance, in the case of Donald Trump, you know, he seemed to want to listen to people like the Chinese leadership. If he had gotten earlier wording, possibly, and I'm just, we're just making this up, um, but if he had gotten earlier wording based on clandestine sources, U.S. presidents Typically, historically, they love that, that sort of information. Maybe he would have listened to it a little bit better. But the most effective intelligence needs to come from the worlds of medicine and public health. Our disease surveillance systems would have been recalibrated to, to try to track the sort of virus that, that developed. We would have been using tools such as wastewater surveillance. You know, poop int was sort of a, a, a joke in the intelligence business before the pandemic started. And now we realize it's something that needs to be used on a much greater, uh, greater basis. And then one last example, uh, contact tracing. You know, here, here in California, for instance, there are certainly contact tracing apps available. The state has one. I'm not sure that I know anybody who uses any. In my counterfactual, we would all have been contributing to the intelligence picture uh, about this, this virus uh, by, by mid-March anyway of last year. I don't know if that really helps answer it, but it's an attempt. Yeah, um, it is. It is hard to imagine. And um, Wesley has asked about whether there's going to be, or in your view, you see any movement towards a, an investigation reviewing the performance of the intelligence community uh, in the whole thing. But of course, that would have to include um, 
things like the dismantling of, of GFIN and some equivalents in the US, um, how long does it take to uh, keep people's attention when, they, when they're tempted to say, well, nothing's happened, so we need the resources elsewhere. But I think when you talk about uh, the, the importance of the, the different health agencies, that suggests to me in, that if an analyst is preparing um, a warning, let's say a strategic warning, and has to look at what the indicators might be that would then perk the interests of decision makers, they're going to have to have pretty good relationships with all the health agencies to know exactly what those uh, indicators should be. And that, that's a great point. And that's part of what I'm trying to do in, in my thinking about this. What I'm hoping uh, that my, uh, my book will do is help bring together these different worlds. And I come from the, the traditional national security, military intelligence world, homeland security, domestic intelligence world. And so we need to learn more on, on that side about the medical, the public health communities and vice versa. And as an example, and again, we still don't know what we don't know about what happened. Uh, but it doesn't appear that, for instance, here, here in the States, uh, famous uh, Dr. Fauci, it doesn't appear that if there had been discussions going on within the classified world of national security intelligence, we, we see some reports that, that maybe U.S. intelligence uh, had some information a, about the outbreak back in November, December of, of 2019. If that was the case, it sure doesn't appear that Dr. Fauci was in on those, those discussions because he sort of medical leader that, that many in America were listening to, you know, he wasn't aware of that. He wasn't talking about that. So we need to, to do a better job. And just one last example, again, on the US experience here, uh, as I think most of us learned after the pandemic began, the primary intelligence agency within the US national security system that tracks medical intelligence issues was a, a relatively small, obscure organization, the National Center for Medical Intelligence, under the Defense Intelligence Agency, headed by a, a military 06, typically a, a colonel or a captain. And, and in sort of the, the big picture of Washington and the intelligence community, that's, that's not enough focus by any means. And so far, I haven't seen any indication that the US is gonna boost uh, the, uh, the attention paid to that organization. There were um, a couple questions that um, picked up on the, the whole idea of uh, receptivity. Um, one of them was, is it simply the case that a lot of decision makers would rather put off a decision uh, on many, many things than, than commit themselves? And the opposite, really, is there a fear among decision makers that they might be seen as, uh, as, uh, as panicking, as paranoid, uh, if, they, if they take some of these broad uh, strategic assessments too seriously, maybe too soon? Well, certainly that's the case, and and I, you know, we can't 2020 hindsight, you know, we we can't avoid that, uh, you know. But as as many experts have have commented about 9/11, that if President Bush during the summer of 2001 had been inspired by his president's daily brief, by his his briefer, if he had been inspired to do something about that, and even if President Bush had said, you know, let's create a whole new uh, uh, aviation security organization. Let's uh, have a whole new set of, of wickets that uh, uh, flyers in the United States and around the world have to go through. Let's have them take their shoes off because who knows what might be there. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't have gone over very well. But, but I think a big part of the problem is, and here I'm, I'm again, this is sort of a counterfactual, but uh, you know, we, have, we don't do a very good job of training, of educating our typical national security leadership on these kinds of non-traditional threats so that when something comes up, they just don't have the background. They just don't have the knowledge, the expertise to deal with it. And as, as we've been, been talking about yesterday, uh, yesterday's panel as well, of course, when there are so many different possible threats, you know, I, I, I'm not arguing that we, we have to pay attention to all of them, that we can pay attention to all of them. But it seems clearly that in this case, we didn't listen. And even our, our organizations that were warning for the last 20 years they essentially weren't listening to their own warnings because we weren't developing the sorts of capabilities that would have been needed to produce the tactical warning, the actual specific warning in this case about the virus that it invaded all of our countries. 
There's a, there's a number of questions that revolve around uh, the, the preparation of assessments. And of course, most assessment organizations take pains to separate their assessment of a situation with the policy and the response to it. But in the case of pandemic and, uh, intelligence and assessments and warning, is there a case to be made for the assessment not only to look at the indicators, but to go on to the so what and what should you do about it? And if you would adhere to the traditional uh, division, um, what are some of the ways that, that the um, warning writers could make sure that they had uh, at least the attention of decision makers? Uh, that's, that's, that's a great point. Uh, certainly, it's the sort of traditional, uh, the, the belief within the US intelligence community, I think the same within the, uh, the Canadian intelligence community, that intelligence doesn't make, we don't make decisions. Uh, that was certainly ingrained in me during my uh, military intelligence career. Uh, you know, I just sort of, in fact, at, as you may know, here in the States, for instance, uh, over history, often in the past, uh, the CIA director would, would leave the Oval Office or, or the White House Situation Room after uh, sitting in or maybe giving a, a threat assessment to the president. The CIA director wouldn't even want to be in the room when the discussion was held about what to do about the problem because that could bias his thinking. He, but we've got to get over that. Uh, and I, I think we are, we are getting over that to a large extent. Uh, one of the buzzwords that's been popular in recent years is opportunity analysis, that we need to use our intelligence tools and analytical tools to provide ideas, provide opportunities to decision makers, not decide what the, the general policy should be, um, but, but one of the, uh, the greatest examples of how that can work, again, I you know, we, we all are prisoners of our own experiences, our own backgrounds, but an example from US military uh, intelligence, for instance, remembering Colin Powell, uh, back during the first Gulf War, uh, Colin Powell uh, is his primary intelligence officer, the J-2 on the, on the joint staff was uh, Navy Admiral Mc Mike McConnell. Uh, and uh, at one point, Mike McConnell appeared to be sort of channeling or, or reading Colin Powell's mind. When uh, Powell would, would ask about some question at a meeting, uh, his intelligence officer, Admiral McConnell, would, would pull, pull out a piece of paper and say, yes, sir, we've already done a study on that, and, and here's what our recommendations are. And Colin Powell would, would say, I didn't even know I was going to ask about that until now. So how did you already come up with an answer for that? And the reason was because the US military had learned by then that operations and command needs to be so closely ingrained with intelligence that Admiral McConnell had been sitting in on all the meetings that, that General Powell had. He had heard things going on. He had heard comments. He had heard the, the sort of backhand uh, side comments that Colin Powell had made. He knew that Colin Powell was worrying about something even before he had worried about it. So that's what we need to do. But I'm worried that, for instance, here in the States, when I, I've talked with uh, uh, local intelligence officials here in the States, for instance, we have a network of what we call state and local fusion centers, intelligence fusion centers. The nearest one uh, to me here in Monterey, California is up in San Francisco. Uh, and when I've spoken to those audiences, I get blank stares and, and those audiences tell me that, well, that's perfectly fine, I guess, but that's not what we do. That's not what local intelligence, local security officials do. We don't do health issues. That's why we've got, you know, health folks. That's the wrong attitude. We've got to work together on this. One of the, one of the questions, um, I'm not sure if it's um, rhetorical or not, so I'll, I'll widen it a bit, but it, it asks really whether there should be uh, some sort of criminal or civil liability for decision makers who ignore warnings that they should be listening to. But I'll broaden the question into, um, is, there, is there a way or is there um, uh, some method of enforcing a broader responsibility for people who were properly warned and didn't follow those warnings? Or is that just politics? Is that left, that has to be left to the system as it operates? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, but I just don't see a way that, that we could do that mm -hmm. other than uh, the, the sort of systems, the checks and balances that already exist in our democracies. 
uh, that that exist to punish uh, uh, leaders uh, who society has felt have, have not led very well. That doesn't always work very well, you know, being voted out of office or something like that. Um, but I think it would be too risky uh, to, uh, and I, even though I am trying to look back 2020 here, and I'm, I'm starting to sort of claiming some sort of uh, knowledge about what we should have done better, but I don't think even I, I can't put myself in the position of leaders back whenever it was. Uh, and say what I would have done at that time. Um, and I'll, I'll just give an, another example here, but I think relates to this that again, might be a little controversial. And I wonder if especially any intelligence professionals uh, would like to comment on this. I think part of the problem uh, may have been uh, here in the United States with Donald Trump was that, as we know, Donald Trump did not trust the intelligence community, did not trust intelligence advisors. That's actually a fairly common thing. That folks with a historical bent uh, no, you know, past presidents have not also not gotten along with their intelligence communities. Richard Nixon, Lyndon Johnson, lots of stories about about that. Um, I think part of the problem may have been that Trump had so much trouble finding the, the intelligence community leaders that he trusted. That by the time this threat arose, he he wasn't ready. He still wasn't ready to trust the leadership. Maybe, in fact, you know, leaders. They need to be able to get uh, the intelligence uh, of officials, just like the advisors that they that they want, um, and and that then leads to I, I think that it's just too hard to after the fact uh, blame uh, blame a leader for not listening to that warning or not listening to to this warning. Is that though somewhat of an inevitable problem? Because if if the intelligence community is dedicated as it should be to truth to power, to telling uh, leaders what the facts are, whether they want to hear it or not, uh, isn't some sort of tension there inevitable? And if it's not inevitable because the leader gets the kind of leaders from the community that, that he wants, would that not depress the possibility of getting the right warning? So is there, you know, how, how exactly do you square this? No, that's true. Um, I, th I think actually I don't, I don't accept that sort of model that what intelligence does is try to uh, provide truth to power. You know, I, I, uh, I think that in fact, you know, there is no such thing as, as truth in, in a sense, uh, as, as a number of, of intelligence leaders have, have said over the years. You know, sometimes you, you hear it phrased that you know, if something is a fact, it's not intelligence. It's, it, it, and sometimes that's that's presented as meaning that if it's something is so simple that that everybody understands it, you know that there's a rock over there, or that you know that military, uh, you know, has an aircraft carrier that's floating around in the South China Sea or whatever, eh, you know, that's not something we deal with. I think it's a, there's a more subtle point there that there that no fact is significant without context, uh, that and there is no truth without that context. So that that's why you need. You need intelligence, not, not to provide ground truth because you can't do that, um, but you need to provide that, that context. And the context in this case could have been, should have been, that there's something going on here in you know, early in December uh, in 2019. There's something going on in China. We think this could be uh, related to this, uh, this lab in, in Wuhan, but the Chinese officials are really, really worried about it. Uh, and we need to put more assets on it now, rather than waiting until December 31st, when we started to first get the indication that something was going on. Do you think some of that uh, knowledge of what, what had been going on would have come if the intelligence community had direct contacts in Wuhan, if, even if they were, say, US diplomats or, or people with, not necessarily people with an intelligence mandate, but if they'd gone and uh, if they'd been able to go to somebody uh, at, the, at a consulate or something and said, look, would you keep an eye out and see if there is something odd happening because uh, it could look like this or it could look like this? Would, is that the sort of thing that the intelligence community could lead on? Well, that's certainly part of it. On, the, on that, the open side, uh, as we now know, uh, the CDC, other organizations have cut back over the years leading up to 2019, 2020, uh, had cut back on their liaison relationships uh, with, with the Chinese. These are open sorts of things. Uh, and clearly that we now can tell that was a mistake. We should not have, have done that. And again, it wasn't just the Trump administration that, that was doing that, uh, that started earlier than that. 
But then there's also there's the clandestine side of things, uh, and and again certainly the the Central Intelligence Agency, the the primary organization with the within the U.S. system that focuses on clandestine human intelligence, it's got plenty of of problems on its plate. But but clearly this should have been more of a point of emphasis than it had been. So that's on the on the clandestine side, but but that open open side, medical public health. Uh, sharing of information is probably even more important. Okay. There's uh, there's uh, two related questions there, and I'll I'll put them together. Um, one is that the U.S. intelligence system is um, much more open in the sense that assessments and intelligence are much more likely to be surfaced for public discussion uh, than is the case in Canada. And uh, some of us have argued uh, about the extent to which that's a, that's a good thing, because the more you're open, the more there is political pressure. Um, but the, so the first part of the question is, um, is the fact that uh, intelligence can be made public uh, an advantage in getting everybody focused on what could be an issue and combining all the resources? And is one of the directions that the U.S. system could go in uh, having more of those types of, let's say, health warnings made public earlier. The second part of the question is, do you feel that the overall um, presence health of the health system itself, that is, whether it's a, whether it's a, a good health system that supports a lot of people, where a lot of people have responsibilities for different aspects, is this a necessary factor in combining all of the information that's needed to see a pandemic coming? So it's really around uh, sharing of information with the public across uh, a vibrant health system, uh, the impact not only of decreasing resources at times for critical parts of the intelligence community, but maybe doing the same, uh, unfortunately, with the health system itself. Well, absolutely. And I think actually those two questions really do uh, uh, merge together. But on the first part of it, in terms of openness, transparency, I've been arguing for a long time that the U.S. intelligence system needs more openness, more transparency, especially when we are talking about uh, domestic or homeland security threats, as we often talk about them here. And the pandemics is clearly one of those. Although I have to say, as I like to tell my my students, most of my students are serving U.S. military officers or, or Homeland Security uh, officials. And I, I tell them that, that if they had been listening to me 20 years ago before I retired from my military career, I wouldn't have been saying that because certainly I, when I was on the inside, I, I figured that you know oversight is, is just uh, something pesky that you have to deal with. Um, but it's kind of surprising how once you, once you put at least one foot outside, as I sort of consider now I'm a government uh, employee, but but one foot outside in the academic world, I kind of see things differently now. Um, and I, I really especially believe that we can and will do a better job of keeping our countries safer if we have a more open discussion about intelligence. I mean, this is not not just to to avoid scandals of the, of the sorts of things that that have have uh, affected our agencies over over history, but it also, we need better oversight in order to be able to do a better job. And we can see that certainly in case of the pandemic, where so much of the data that we need to make decisions about health threats, so much of that data comes from, in the, in the states, for instance, from the local level. We needed to have, you know, down to the, the hospitals, the counties, the cities. We've seen, we saw some success, great success stories early on in the pandemic, of local communities in the states taking action very, very quickly, but uh, and others not doing that. So we need to, to get that data uh, from the local side and that, that is from the, the public the public side. Um, so, so we need more, more transparency, uh, but in, in particular, we need it when it comes to these sorts of threats. I'm not sure if I really got to the second part of your question though. Yeah, let me let me. Um, when you talk about your your colleagues in the armed forces, it it brings up one aspect that uh, we could we could look at for a moment. I remember when we were debating in Canada whether there had been any sources of information that gave an indication even before January 
uh, that there might be a really serious problem. And one of the things raised with me by a, by a reporter who called me was that uh, there had been a, 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 some information from the US military because it had been visiting part of China that there was something odd going on. Uh, is the fact that there are um, US personnel, military personnel posted all over the world, is that uh, an advantage that the intelligence community could draw on? And is there a parallel, say, with diplomatic personnel or business personnel or others who could be specifically contacted or, or regularly debriefed? Well, that's an interesting point. I, I think I, I should say, I, I think we really don't yet know what the story is about these reports of, of some information, some intelligence being, being reported on by organizations such as that National Center for Medical Intelligence, um, that might be uh, some of what that reporter had been talking about. Um, so we still don't know uh, really what was going on behind the scenes in the, in the classified world uh, back in November or, de or December. Uh, and we need, we need an official study uh, just like the 9-11 Commission did that can look behind that closed door uh, and then sanitize that uh, so that, that we can learn those lessons. But I, I think that probably using military personnel, that's not, not going to work very well. Uh, you know, we certainly do, and the U.S. military is often criticized uh, for having such a, a widespread net uh, around the world. Uh, we're really the, the only the, uh, system uh, that, that has such a capable worldwide network, including people doing non-intelligence collection. But, but I know from my, my experience, uh, that it, it doesn't tend to work very well when you are wearing the U.S. military uniform uh, and you go abroad to some place that might be interesting where you might want to uh, collect something. Uh, and the problem is uh, you're exactly the sort of person that that, that, that country uh, you know, knows to watch out for. Uh, it doesn't tend to work very well. Yeah. I'll ask you one final question, and it comes to this issue, which we really started with on the questions, which is uh, an investigation. If, uh, if you were consulted by uh, senior people in Washington and asked, what's the best form of investigation to really get to the bottom of what happened and make sure that we're prepared the next time the way we should be, what recommendations would you make about the kind of investigation that would serve that purpose best? Well, and that's, that's a great question. Uh, we certainly deal with that issue here in the US, for instance, right now, as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, the U.S. were trying to figure out what kind of investigation to do for January 6th, uh, you know, and, and that that has sort of sucked all the the air out of the room, the oxygen out of the room for for these sorts of things. Uh, and there have been many kinds. There are many kinds of, of such uh, investigation, official investigations. I've done a little writing about about this. Um, it it seems we we need an official government here in the U.S. anyway. Um, I think the most effective would be an official U.S. government, congressionally mandated, uh, but we need then the president to sign off on it. And of course, yes, in today's environment, there's no way that, it, that it's going to avoid being partisan, being political. Uh, but we need to try to at least be bipartisan. You know, the 9-11 Commission, for instance, wasn't nonpartisan. You know, it, it, it wasn't made up of, of political figures who had a point of view. Uh, you know, that would be the sort of the non-governmental scientific uh, study uh, that, that, you know, maybe, maybe ha that has a role as well. But we need an official study, and, and those studies are going to be, they're going to be, the people are going to be partisan. But what we don't want is, I'll go back to last, I spent a lot of my time looking at past uh, intelligence uh, issues and looking for lessons for the future. What we don't want is something that would be similar to the investigations of Pearl Harbor, which were partisan investigations, which, which all came out with, with uh, you know, appendices and, and alternative views uh, and, and that, that sort of a thing. That was similar to the first uh, government investigation of 9-11. There was a congressional committee that investigated 9-11, came out with an 800-page uh, report that nobody read uh, because it was, for one thing, it, it just wasn't packaged well. Um, you know, it was released with lots of blocked out lines that were still classified and things. But also, it was it was a political uh, uh, document. We need something more like the 9/11 Commission, and we need to have leaders both on the national security, but definitely on the medical and public health worlds. 
And those are two different worlds. Until I started looking into this, talking to experts, I didn't even realize you know, the, the differences in the professions between medicine and public health. We need all of that together to be able to go behind the scenes to find out what the, the U.S. government knew, what the medical community knew, and lessons for the, for the future. And I think it has to be start from the top. Uh, Congress and the president have to sign off. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, it's been great having you back at CASIS. Uh, this is an extremely important topic, and it's, it's uh, more than fortuitous that you've researched it from your perspective on what kind of warnings are effective and how we can make them effective. So thanks once again. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. With that, I'll turn it back to Thomas to say a couple closing words and maybe some words about tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, very, very short closing words on my part since it is already uh, 1.30, but simply to say thank you very much to everybody in attendance. And uh, we hope to see you tomorrow with uh, the third of three days for this annual Cases Sips um, virtual conference. So thank you very much and hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>